Uh, at, the, at, at, the way, at the whaling wall, you know, they go like this. You know what they're, they're they do that to stay awake. So, so if you uh, feel a little drowsy, stand up and just dance. You can't imagine that the hoops that these people are doing back here to get our technology going. It was out of sync. But anyway, it's, it's back in sync. People, people praying. Hey, Don Perkins needs no introduction because he had an introduction this morning. So we're blessed to have Don. So let's give him a hand. Let's go. Mic test one, two. Oh, Mic test, all right. You hear me now? Yes. All right. I thank God for the media guys. I mean, they have a very important ministry just like the speakers do. Uh, they help us do what we do, so I'm grateful for them as well. Uh, before I get into our uh, opening prayer, I've just, again, mentioned some materials. This is a wonderful book entitled Heavenly Rewards uh, by Dr. Mark Hitchcock. This, it deals with the judgment seat of Christ as Christians stand before the Bema seat. It's a wonderful book. Uh, we have what's called the twofers. These are uh, two DVD uh, messages packets. We have the two comings, which deal with the rapture and the second coming. The two judgments deal with the judgment seat of Christ for Christians, the great white throne for, for unredeemed. We have the two realities, the reality of heaven and the reality of hell. Uh, we also have this in a USB format too, but these we call the twofers, and uh, it, it's designed to help you. Again, our Revelation series, Understanding the Book of Revelation, 71 TV programs, 24 uh, uh, DVDs, as well as the 71 programs, uh, video, audio on USB. Now, the USB is for your smart TVs. Now, if you don't know what a smart TV is, if you, if you bought a brand new TV, it's a smart TV, but get your grandchildren to plug the USB in the back for you, all right? I, I, I thought I should say that, then maybe people get that one, but it's really good. Uh, the message I'm, I'm sharing today, part one, now is part two, 10 signs we're living in the, in the end times. Uh, again, we have that in a USB format as well. Then the Bible prophecy manual, Bible prophecy, God's order of events. Uh, we just updated this, added two new uh, subjects there uh, with the dispensational chart in the back. And then our website, www.accordingthenumber2prophecy.org. Again, we're part of the social media platforms as well as our weekly program on his channel. Uh, it airs every week. Our program is called Your Future in Bible Prophecy. Uh, it's a great program. And then our app, you can actually download the app. or You can, you can scan it from your uh, phone, the QR code, and uh, you can download on your Apple device, Google, your Android. Or either, if you have Roku, you can download a card prophecy on your Roku, and uh, you, can watch, you can watch our programs there. Now, looking at part two of the message, 10 signs we're living in the end times. I want you to bow your hearts as we ask the Lord to bless his word. Father God, again, it's a privilege to stand before you and also before your people. Uh, it's a privilege, O oh God, to, uh, to serve you. And again, it's an honor. And Lord, I ask as we uh, look at the second uh, part of this message, I ask by your Holy Spirit that you would open the scriptures to our hearts, challenge us, stir us, uh, convict us, O oh God, to, to be uh, uh, fellow laborers uh, in the harvest in the last days. Now, Lord, we come against every scheme of the enemy, and we ask for an open heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're looking at part two of the study, and then we closed out looking at uh, uh, sign number four. And then as I shared uh, in the morning session, I want to just kind of reiterate here. Uh, we're in the church age. What's going to close the church age is the next event called the rapture of the church. But all the signs, all the indicators point to the second coming of Christ. So these indicators that I'm giving today are dealing with the, the signs that point to the literal return of Jesus Christ. So now we're going to move into sign number five, which is the preaching of the gospel. And again, I love this one because this is an exciting uh, sign. Uh, the gospel is going around the world. And again, as it does, uh, is literally helping to bring Christ back. And again, we're going to see some things here. So I'm going to give you two passages here. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said this, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Also in the gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 10, he said, and this gospel must first be published 
among all nations. And again, uh, you know, it's a good thing that the gospel is going around the world. Uh, it's reaching uh, uh, the, into the nook and crannies. Uh, but but in, in Matthew, it said that the gospel, is, uh, it would preach for a witness unto all nations. Now, some people will receive the gospel and some won't. But it's going to be a witness against those who reject it. But the gospel is going. Uh, the gospel is marching around the world. Now, I'm going to read an article. This article appeared uh, in the, uh, I think it was the Moody Monthly, uh, no, Christianity Today. And this was back in uh, 1986. And the older this article gets, I think the more valuable it is. But it says, Christianity is still the world's top religion and faith is growing. So I'm going to quote from this article. And I really like this. It talks about Bible translations, figures increase. Listen to this. American Bible Society reports that Bible portions were translated into 21 new languages in 1985, bringing uh, to 1,829 the number of languages in which, the Bi which Bibles or portion of scriptures are available. Uh, the 1985 translation work brought the scriptures to an additional 6.5 million people. Now, here's the part I want to I look at. At this point, it says about 98% of the world's population have the Bible available in a language that they can understand. Now, this was 95, 85. At that point, they said 98% of the world had a Bible or portions of Scripture. So basically 2% left, right? Uh, this was 1985. So uh, with what we have today is so amazing because the gospel is going into the nook and crannies of the world. So I'm going to read some other statistics here. This is from the Wycliffe translators. It says one in five people are still waiting for the Bible uh, in their own language. 7,378 languages uh, are spoken in the world. 17, uh, I mean, 717 languages have a full Bible, okay? Uh, 1,582 languages have uh, complete New Testaments. Uh, 1,196 languages have some portions of the Bible. 2,899 uh, language, languages have active translation work. So the Bible is being translated around the world. Uh, you have the Wycliffe translators as other different groups that are going into, you know, native area, and they are uh, teaching them the languages they're learning. Uh, they're learning the culture, some of them creating alphabets for them. Uh, but the gospel is going behind the scene as a sign of the end time. But I think one of the most powerful things that's helping to bring Christ back is technology. And again, uh, looking at technology, uh, the Bible apps and different Bible things. Now, we, again, we have our website. We have the Blue Letter Bible. Anybody here have Blue Letter Bible? Okay, Blue Letter Bible. I serve on the board of Blue Letter Bible. Uh, Blue Letter Bible is one of the best online Bibles uh, out there. Uh, and I mean, some of the statistics that we get of how the Bible is going into the nook and crannies, uh, the third world countries, uh, behind the bamboo curtain, the iron curtain, or any curtain that's trying to block the gospel. The gospel is marching on, which in turn is bringing Christ back. And again, it's exciting. You know, uh, our website, again, we've been online since 1995. We're reaching more people than I could ever imagine. Uh, I got a letter from a lady uh, in a Polynesian island in the Pacific. Uh, she showed a map. Her island looked like a little speck out there in the Pacific Ocean. She said, Brother Perkins, she said, your ministry and ministries like yours are the pastors that we have uh, because we have no pastors on the island. And she said, your ministry and ministries like yours is, is bringing the gospel to us. So the gospel is going around the world, being preached and published. Uh, it's being published electronically now, and it's going all over the world. Now, I do know that there's a lot of negative about the Internet, but, but this is the good about the Internet, and it's helping to bring Christ back. Uh, and again, I, I just love that sign. So look at sign number six. Sign number six is globalism, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about this globalism. So what is globalism? Uh, globalism is a national policy of treating the whole world as a proper sphere of political influence. And again, this globalist uh, system, uh, I, I like this picture. You have, you have the world and you have all these big world leaders and thinkers thinking that they are in control. And again, really, this is just a sign of the time. I mean, all these guys are leading uh, to that one world government, one world system uh, that Antichrist will, will take control over. Uh, but it's amazing to see what we are seeing today. And again, I'm going to look at that. Now, I want to quote this. Uh, the world is, is ready to receive an Antichrist, that true one world leader. 
uh, Henry Spike, uh, back in 1957 to 1960, he was the Secretary General of NATO. And listen to what he said. He said, we want a man of, su of sufficient stature to hold the alliances of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. They said, send us such a man, be he God or devil, and we will receive him. Uh, this is the heart of the world today. They want a one world leader. They, they want a man that can solve all of, all of the problems. Well, I believe that globalism is playing a major part into that. As a matter of fact, all of the ism, globalism, communism, socialism, all of the isms, they really all controlled by the same antichrist spirit uh, to bring a one world government and humanism, man trying to solve everything, which they cannot do it uh, again. But we are witnessing some events and things that are happening. Now, the Bible does tell us here in Revelation 13, 7, in regards to the Antichrist, that he will be a one world leader. Uh, he will be a world leader. So verse 7 of Revelation 13, it says, and it was given unto him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. Now, these are people, saints that will be born again after, uh, uh, after the church's rapture inside the tribulation. You have a lot of people get saved. They will be saved. But at that time, they're under a different dispensation. Uh, God's going to allow Antichrist uh, to wear them out. I mean, a lot of people that are born again inside the tribulation will die for their faith. But it says, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Uh, the Antichrist will be a world leader. Uh, and I think everything that is happening today are the foreshadows that are playing uh, a major role. I've said many times, I think it's like God is in heaven moving major chess pieces on his prophetic chessboard. He's moving things into place. And again, we're going to see that. Now, I want to quote from the book called Foreshadow. This is a wonderful book uh, by Steve Miller. And listen to what he, he's going to tell us in regards to the rise of globalism. He said, every year in January, a select group of, world, of the world's most influential people descend uh, upon the mountain resort town of Davos, Switzerland, for several days of high energy meetings and networking. The gathering includes an impressive lineup of prominent, prominent heads of state, business executives, political leaders, cultural experts, uh, media personalities, and of course, celebrities. The event is by invitation only. Uh, one and many of the attendees comprise are the who's who of the elite, the glitterati of glitteratis. These are people who really have the power to make things happen. At least they think they do. You got to understand, saints, a sovereign God is in control. You know, when Jesus went to Calvary's cross, Pilate thought he had control. Uh, don't you know, I can, I can stop you from dying. And Jesus said, no man take my life. I give my life. Jesus was in full control the whole time. When Judas betrayed him, Jesus was still in control. He knew everything that had to happen in order to bring salvation to humanity. But it's the same situation here. These men think they're in control, but a sovereign God is really in control. Listen to this. Globalism says they want to make the world a better place. They speak of fostering a worldwide unity that brings harmony, peace, and prosperity to everyone. Their goal is to diminish regional rivalries and build oneness. Their language is that of transcending all barriers uh, to achieving a united humanity. They say everyone should be able to benefit as humanity continues to make advances and overcome the challenges that hinder or divide us. Again, a one world mentality. Uh, everything is happening. And you know what's amazing to me is that what we're seeing today, how things are coming together to put a one world system in place. Now, many of you know of this gentleman, Klaus uh, Schwab. He's the founder and executive uh, chairman uh, of the World Economic Forum. So let me just read some things he said, and some of you are going to know some of this, uh, in regards to the pandemic. He said, the pandemic represents a rare but, but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, to reimagine, and to reset the world. So these guys thinking that they can reset the world. We're going to make the world better now. We're going to reset everything. We got the know-how. We have the wisdom. Yeah. The new world, listen to this, the new world could emerge and uh, could emerge the contours of which it is incumbent upon us to reimagine and to redraw. Again, they want to make it a new world. They want to they make it a, a new system. Uh, the New World uh, Economic Forum, 
says that by 2030, listen to this, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. I don't think so. No, you're not going to take my stuff and I'm going to be happy. No, no. This is how they think. This is their mentality. Look at this next one. Look at this one. Uh, They say by 2030, you'll eat less meat. Now, these guys, believe it or not, they are attacking meat. Uh, I I watched one of the executives of this thing, and he said, I I no longer eat meat. And uh, what they want to do now, they want you to start eating crickets and bugs and and, and all this stuff. But uh, let me show you something here. I'm going to give you a scripture. This is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Paul wrote, he said, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. He goes on to say this, forbidding to marry. We have a culture forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and of them uh, and them that know the truth. Uh, you know, I don't want to eat no bugs. Uh, I don't eat no crickets. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I would love to have me a bone-in ribeye. Uh, yes, I, I would, would really love to have that. Longhorn, you know what I mean? Uh, but I'm going to show you something. What these people do, because they, they have an agenda, a worldwide agenda, uh, they, they have enlisted some of Hollywood. And this is uh, Nicole Kidman eating bugs. She's eating mealworms here, horn worms, and fried grasshoppers. Uh, again, the culture is, is buying into uh, what, what these guys want to do. And again, it's just unbelievable uh, what, is, what is happening before us today. But again, this globalism, this one world system is coming into place right before our eyes. Now, I want to quote here uh, Dr. Erwin Lutzer from his book, No Reason to Hide. Listen to what he says in regards to this global reset. He said, will we uh, submit uh, to the great global reset? He said, Klaus, Klaus Schwab. Uh, The man who founded the World World Economic Forum has written a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset, which states uh, in the introduction, since it made its entry on the world stage, COVID-19 has dramatically torn up the existing script of how to govern countries, live with others, and take part in the global economy. So they said uh, COVID just totally changed everything. So now we have a, a, whole, a whole new blueprint that we can, we can basically change the world. Uh, quoting from this book, and you have it on the table out there, uh, Global Reset by Mark Hitchcock and Jeff Kinley, they said this, while there will, will no doubt be many twists and turns in the march to, to the global economy uh, domination, the quickest and simplest way to take the reins of world economy uh, is to implement the global cashless economy. A cashless revolution, the Great Reset, has been used nearly interchangeably with the global currency reset. The world is entering a so-called fourth fourth industrial digital revolution. Daily headlines are announcing uh, the imminent arrival. And again, this is so true because uh, a lot of the articles that are out there today, they're literally talking about uh, nations now want to go with a total digital currency. I was flying to another conference uh, a a month, a a few weeks ago, and I met a guy. He uh, he's a lawyer uh, who deals with the uh, uh, securities, and we got to talking. He found I was a preacher on Bible prophecy, so we started talking and had just a great time talking. And he told me, "Say, you know, uh, sir," he said, uh, "One thing I'm concerned about," and he said, "And it's going to happen. It will happen. uh, Is this digital currency that's going to that's going to take over the whole world?" He said, "It is going to happen. You can bank on it." He deals with the securities, and he said it's going to happen. Uh, they want to be able to track and 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 uh, you know track everybody's buying and, and 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 selling habits, and also people that are hiding money. You know, like the cartel. Uh, when everything goes digital, uh, if in order for them to have their money, they're going to have to declare what they have. If they don't declare it, their money will become worthless. And uh, he was sharing about this digital age, and I'm telling you, everything right now is leading leading toward that. Again, we're living. Uh, again, in some amazing times. Now, in this, they quoted a number of articles or headlines of articles about the cashless culture. Uh, August 30, 2020, it says, our cash-free future is getting closer. This was the New York Times. 
Uh, July 6, 2020, U.S. moves closer to a digital dollar. Uh, that's Forbes magazine. Uh, July 120, uh, Bank of England governor signals central bank digital currency is coming. This is, this is the heart of the world. They want a digital age, digital currency. July 15, 2020, China creates its own digital currency, a first for major economy, Wall Street Journal. Uh, April 5th, 2021, China's ri uh, raising uh, cashless society, a rising cashless society. Uh, this was reported in the eye uh, on Asia. And then the last one here, uh, October 2020 reports indicates that Switzerland will stop using cash by 2023 this year. Again, we have a culture now that is moving quickly toward this global age, digital age. And again, all of this literally plays into the end times. Now, again, we don't need to be afraid of it. Uh, you know, we just do. I, I, I was talking to a lady the other day and I told her, you know, uh, with the digital age, I know people are tracking us, you know. And I said, well, I don't mind them tracking me. If they track me, I'm going to lead them right to Jesus. <laughs> just, just track me, you know. I'm going to take you right to the Savior. You know, at home, I, I was sharing with them, uh, I get a call every day on my office phone, uh, and they just hold the phone. They hold it. So if they're going to waste my time to hold the phone, then I'm going to preach the gospel to them. So what I do when they call every day, every day they get a, they get a Bible message. I say, well, since you're calling me, Jesus Christ love you. He's coming back soon. Are you ready? Boom, to hang up the phone. <laughs> you ought to try when you get those, those people that call you all the time. Just start preaching the gospel to them. Yeah, I, I take advantage of that. All right. Now, let's move a little further. Look at sign number seven. Sign number seven, Israel preparing for temple worship. Now, again, a lot of these signs I'm, I'm dealing with, these are things that would take place during the time of great tribulation. Uh, now, Israel, this little nation, believe it or not, uh, behind the scenes, she's preparing for a third temple. Uh, the scripture literally predicts a third temple to come. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a verse here. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, he says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him hear and let him understand. Now, Jesus was literally talking to his Jewish brethren during the time of the mid part of the tribulation, because uh, when this event happened, this will happen at, right at the mid part of the great tribulation. And Jesus telling his Jewish brothers, when you see the abomination that makes desolation, in other words, the Antichrist will desecrate the Jewish altars. He will stop them from sacrificing. Now, in order for the Antichrist to desecrate the altar and stop the sacrificing, the altar and the sacrifice and the temple must be here. So behind the scenes, the nation of Israel, they are preparing to build this temple. Now, let me give you one more, one more verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. The apostle Paul talking about the Antichrist. He said, who opposeth and exalt himself above all that is called God, all that is worship." so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Here, another reference to a third temple. In order for Antichrist to sit in that temple, in order for him to desecrate the altars there, there must be a third temple. So behind the scenes, the nation of Israel, they are working feverishly behind the scenes to restore temple worship. Uh, not only that, but they've re reinstated the, San, uh, the, uh, the uh, Sanhedrin court, uh, uh, 2,500 years they have not had the Sanhedrin court. This is the religious governing body uh, of Israel. They have already announced a high priest. Uh, they have created all the furnishings and, and uh, all of that. But uh, of late, uh, I know many of you have probably heard about the, about the ashes of the red heifer. Uh, so there were five red heifers that just came to Israel, and I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to show this video that CBN, they, they did a great coverage uh, on this. So uh, if they turn the volume up back there. Oh, boy. You got it? All right, it's coming. You know, technology is good, saints, when it works. It's really good. All right. You want to try it again? Ready? Oh, wait a minute. I think it's the preacher this time. <laughs> I'll plug it in. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> These are the red heifers that landed at Israel's Ben Gurion Airport. Rabbis believe the ashes of a red heifer are necessary for purifying priests to serve in a future temple. 
The heifers were discovered and brought to Israel with the help of the Bone Israel Building Israel Organization and its team leader, Byron Stinson. Rabbis from the Temple Mount Institute approached Stinson about the unique cattle. They said, Byron, could you look in Texas and find us a red heifer? I wasn't expecting that, and it was shocking to me to think about it, but I know a lot of ranchers, and I know a little bit about cattle, being from Texas, and I always say yes to these Jewish rabbis because they're my friends, and I love them, and uh, why not? This began an in-depth process of finding the rare heifer that meets key stipulations found in the Bible. The Bible gives us a clue as to the significance of the red heifers here in uh, Numbers chapter 19, verse 1 and 2, where it says that God spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ritual law that God has commanded, instruct the children of Israel to bring you a red cow without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which no yoke has been laid. So it says that we're supposed to take a perfectly red cow with no uh, white hairs or dark hairs at all and a cow that no yoke has ever been on. So as a result, it's very, very rare to find a baby cow that is completely red. The ashes of the red heifer would be used to purify water from the Gihon. Oh goodness, I'm so sorry. Can't believe that happened. Oh, I tell you, technology, man. I'm gonna get you further back in there, hold on. Or verse 1 and 2, where it says that God spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ritual law that God has commanded, instruct the children of Israel to bring you a red cow without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which no yoke has been laid. So it says that we're supposed to take a perfectly red cow with no uh, white hairs or dark hairs at all and a cow that no yoke has ever been on. So as a result, it's very, very rare to find a baby cow that is completely red. The ashes of the red heifer would be used to purify water from the Gihon Spring in the city of David. Just a few ashes could purify thousands of gallons of water. That water can be then purified priests from any contact with a dead body so they can offer sacrifice in the temple. Some Jews go every single day to a ritual bath, to a mikvah, in order to approach God in prayer in purity. However, it is not the same because we don't have the red heifer. Once we have the red heifer, we'll be completely pure and we'll be able to rebuild the temple. The red heifer must also be two years old. These cattle are just around a year old and could qualify in just over a year. So if they're able to make it without growing the white hairs or black hair, I think with five of them, we have a really good chance of that then they will be the first one in 2,000 years. The Jewish sage Maimonides from the 12th century said throughout the first and second temples there were nine red heifers. He said the tenth would signal the appearance of the Messiah. That's why many are excited about this arrival. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Now again, this is really amazing because uh, what they want to do, they, they want to, again, reestablish the third temple. In order to do that, they must have the ashes of the red heifer. Uh, they use it to sanctify all of the, the temple uh, furnishings, the priests themselves. Now, it won't bring salvation to them. Uh, they rejected Christ, and uh, since they don't, they don't know him, they're looking for atonement to be reinstituted to bring peace to them, which it won't happen. Uh, Jesus uh, is their Messiah, which they're going to find out as they go through the season of the Great Tribulation. But events are being set up today uh, in Israel. You can, you can go online and watch uh, uh, young Jewish boys being trained in animal sacrifice, uh, how, to, uh, how to sacrifice lambs. Uh, they are in preparation for the next third temple. So this is an event that's happening behind the scene. Now let's go to sign number eight. And we're still looking at Israel here, but now we're going to see Israel blossom and bloom. And what I love about this, uh, my wife and I, we just returned from Israel in September. Uh, every time I go there, I always look for this fulfillment. And again, you know, I do know that this prophecy will go on into the millennial kingdom. But since Israel has come back into world history, God has blessed this little land. Uh, whenever Israel's enemies occupied the land, the land would not produce for them. Uh, and God said that when Israel would, would come back, that he would cause the land to produce uh, for his children. So I'm going to give you a few verses here. This is Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 8. Uh, the prophet wrote, God says, uh, but ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, 
for they are at hand to come. Verse 9 says, For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and you shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, and uh, all the house of Israel, even all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited, and the waste cities shall be rebuilt. Now, this prophecy is literally coming to pass before our very eyes. Many of the waste cities that were destroyed are now thriving cities, Ascalon, Ashdod. These cities have come back into world history, just like God said. He said, I will multiply men upon you. Uh, the nation of Israel, I mean, the population is just amazing. Uh, God says in the latter days that uh, he would do a miracle, and Jeremiah said he would do a miracle in the regathering of the Jewish people back to the land. He said, I would do a miracle in the latter days that's going to be greater than when, when he delivered them from Egypt. And he said that you will no longer rehearse to your children that I brought you out of Egypt, but you will tell your children about how I have regathered you from the four corners of the world. God has regathered the Jewish people from all over the world. Uh, in the nook and cranny, God has, has, has tucked the Jewish people all over the world. Uh, in 2018, uh, the tribe of Manasseh returned back to Israel. This was uh, the, the tribe of Israel, Manasseh, but they were in the land of India. These were Indian Jews that migrated back to Israel from the tribe of Manasseh. Uh, then you have the Ethiopian Jews that uh, 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 were part of King Solomon and Queen of Sheba. Uh, they were literally in Egypt. This is the, uh, the Phalashish Jews that have re regathered and have come to the land of Israel. God is bringing them back. And I really believe this. He's bringing them back. He's populating the land for the time of great tribulation. Uh, we do know based on Revelation 7 that during the time of tribulation, God is going to, uh, he's going to uh, seal 144,000 of all the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, 12,000 each. Well, in order for those tribes to be there, he must regather them. And this is exactly what he's doing before our very eyes. Now, I'm going to give one more verse here in reference to this and then one more after that. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 10 says, God says, and I will multiply upon you man and beast and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates and will do better unto you than at your beginning, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So the land would produce for the nation of Israel uh, when they occupy the land. And again, this is exactly what's happening. Uh, these are pictures I took uh, in the Judean wilderness. These are date palms that are growing all over Israel. Uh, not only that, but uh, they've been growing uh, in, in the salty soil uh, around the Dead Sea. It's just amazing uh, what is happening. And then uh, they just fill in the world with fruit. But I'm going to show you another prophecy, and I'm going to show you this wonderful picture. Look at this picture here. Uh, Isaiah 27, 6 says this. And he says, He, God, shall cause them that come of Jacob or come of Israel to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Now, this is an amazing prophecy. I went to Israel. Uh, I came home from my trip. I went to my local grocery store, and lo and behold, in the grocery store were Jaffa oranges. And I'm looking, I'm saying, Jaffa? And the Lord reminded me of Isaiah 27, 6. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. This little old country in Israel had fruit in my neighborhood. I say, Lord, it's amazing. Uh, Israel is, is, is fulfilling prophecy before our very eyes. And what's so exciting about it, I, mean, I talked to the uh, produce manager. I said, sir, do you mind if I take a picture? He said, yeah, help yourself. He knew what I was doing. I took a picture of these, of these Jaffa oranges, and I said, Lord, it is amazing that uh, I literally experienced uh, a prophecy that, that's coming to pass in the land of Israel. Saints, we are living in some amazing times. Now, let's move on to sign number nine. Now, I'm giving you some unique signs of the times. This is sign number nine, the sealed east gate. Now, this is an amazing little prophecy here. Now, uh, I took this picture in Israel. Uh, this here is, uh, is, is the city of David. Uh, here you have the Kidron Valley. But you see this gate here? This gate here is called the east gate. And I'll bring it a little bit, little bit closer for you. Uh, this is the east gate. Uh, this is the gate that is sealed to this day. And uh, it's, it's based on prophecy. Now, this gate has been opened, but it's always been resealed. And it's been sealed now for the past 500 years. But it's sealed, I believe, because of Bible prophecy. And uh, you look here, you see these graves here? The, the Arabs, uh, they put graves here to stop Messiah from coming through the gates. Now, how many know 
that those graves will not stop Jesus from coming through them gates. Uh, he's the Lord of the resurrection. He is the resurrection. Well, let me read the prophecy to you, and I'll give you a little commentary. Ezekiel chapter 44, verses uh, uh, 1 through 3, the prophet wrote, Then he brought me back, uh, back the way of the gate of the outer sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Verse uh, 2 and 3, Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, have entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. Now, uh, I'm going to read a little, a, little, a little history. Why was the gate sealed? As mentioned previously, the Eastern Gate was ultimately sealed, shut, in 1541 by the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman. However, prior to this time, the gate was closed in 810, also by the Muslims, then reopened in 1102 by the Crusaders, then walled up again by uh, Saladin, uh, Suladan, uh, the first sultan of Egypt and Syria. After defeating the Crusaders in 1187 and gaining control of Palestine uh, and the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the final sealing shut of the gate was completed uh, by Suleiman, uh, is said to have been a defensive move by the sultan. As derived from Jewish literature, the gate is said to be the point at which the Jewish Messiah will enter the city of Jerusalem. And therefore, in order to prevent this from occurring, the sultan sealed the gate. But he don't realize what he was doing. He was literally sealing the gate for prophecy. Because Jesus is going to come back and believe you me, saints, that gate will open. Quoting one of my colleagues, Dr. Dave Reagan, as he talked about the prophetic symbolism of this, he said, The Eastern Gate has remained sealed now for almost 500 years, and the Muslim cemetery still blocks the entrance. The old wall city uh, has eight gates, uh, the Eastern Gate, uh, and it alone is sealed, just as prophesied in Ezekiel 44. The world would call this an amazing coincidence. I call it a God incident, and I really like that. He said, I believe the Eastern Gate is proof positive that the Bible is the word of God. Its ceiling is clear, evidence we are living in the end times. The gate awaits the return of Messiah. Then and only then will it be open. And again, I really believe that what we are witnessing again is just some amazing things. But again, these people, they really think that they can, they can stop God from doing what he's going to do. Uh, God is amazing and he will fulfill prophecy. Now, for time, we start just a little bit late, so I'm going to go to the last sign. And it's, again, we're still dealing with the nation of Israel. Uh, here, we're going to see sign number 10. Uh, this is the sign of Jerusalem, a cup of trembling. How many would agree with me that the land of Israel is an unstable region? Yeah, there's no peace in the region, right? Uh, well, guess what? It's by God's design. Uh, God has, has allowed it to happen uh, because the only way Israel will experience peace is when his son sits on the throne of his father, David. So let me give you the prophecy here. Many of you know this. This is Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Uh, this is an amazing prophecy that I believe we have seen the, the beginnings of it now before us. Uh, verse 2 of Zechariah 12, he said this. Behold, God says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So God said, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. It's like having a cup of coffee, but it's shaking. You can't drink it because it's, it's, it's shaking, it's trembling. He goes on to say here in verse 3, And in that day, he said, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, this is an amazing prophecy. Because it's telling us that eventually all the people, uh, literally all the nations, will literally come against this little old, little old, uh, little old nation called Israel. But here he says here that he's going to make Jerusalem and Israel a burden to the world. And again, this is truly what's happening now. The world thinks that if we can just stabilize Israel, there will be world peace all over the world. And many people are trying to stabilize that region. God says here, he says... Uh, all that burden themselves, those that try to grab Jerusalem and Israel to make peace, God says, if you try to make peace in that region, I'm going to cut you in pieces. And what this tells me is that uh, the United States need to get out of the peace business. Uh, no president can bring peace to the region. No prime minister can bring peace to the region. 
Uh, every president from Carter has tried to bring peace to the region. Uh, all they had was a photo op. Uh, before they can, they can sign the line, you know, a skirmish broke out. Uh, God would not allow a man, a president, a prime minister to bring peace to the region outside of his son. The only way Israel is going to experience a lasting peace is when Jesus sits on the throne of his father, David. You know, the Bible commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And what happened is this. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we are literally praying for the, uh, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. We are praying for Jesus to come back and set up his government. That's the only time it's going to have peace. So in light of this, I'm going to show you, again, prophecy before our very eyes. Look at this. Biden backs a two-state solution along the 1967 lines to end Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So our current administration, Biden administration, believe that they can stabilize Israel. They can grab the burden and make peace in the region. So listen to his plan. President Biden stressed in a speech after his meeting with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Bethlehem on Friday that a two-state solution based on the 1967 lines with agreement upon uh, land swaps is the best way to achieve uh, peace between Israel and Palestine. So in other words, uh, he said that Israel needs to go back to the 67 border. If they go back to the 67, they are getting rid of Jerusalem. Uh, that won't happen. Uh, why it matters, Biden's address, the first time as president, he laid out the parameters for ending the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, was seen as a win for the Palestinians who were hoping uh, to get a diplomatic achievement from the president's visit in the form uh, of a, a more uh, detailed U.S. public position on the conflict. So President Biden told uh, the prime minister there that if you go back to the 67 borders, Israel will experience peace. Well, we tried that before uh, under the Bush administration when they forced Israel to give up Gaza, and that did not happen right uh, well. We should have never forced Israel to give it up. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to show you a video now. Uh, the Israelis, they created a video that is ex going to explain to us why they cannot go back to the 67 borders. And uh, this video is quite uh, self-explanatory, but look at this video. Gotta hit the button. Here we go. Every state has the right of self-defense and to secure borders to protect itself from hostile invasions and terror. Israel is a small state surrounded by Arab countries 650 times its size, some of which are large bases of global terror. Only 44 miles separate between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea. After the Six-Day War in 1967, when Israel was attacked by four armies on three fronts, United Nations Security Council Resolution 242 stated, that Israel was entitled to new defensible borders to replace the previous fragile lines from which it was attacked. What are Israel's defensible borders? What are its essential security needs? The Jordan Rift Valley, Israel's eastern frontier, forms a natural barrier between Israel and the countries of Jordan, Iraq, and Iran. The Jordan Valley rises from an area that is 1,200 feet below sea level to a hilly ridge of up to 3,000 feet, creating a steep 4,200-foot virtual wall opposite any force attacking from the east. The growing threat of global jihad activity near Israel's borders requires it to prevent infiltrations of terrorists and weapons. When Israel left the Philadelphia corridor in Gaza, it became a highway for the infiltration of terrorists and the flow of hundreds of tons of ammunition and weaponry from all over the Arab world, aimed at Israeli civilians. The Jordan Valley is the equivalent of Gaza's Philadelphia Corridor in the West Bank. To defend itself, Israel must retain control over the Jordan Valley. This is Israel's mountain ridge, rising up to 3,000 feet. 
it dominates Israel's major coastal cities, where more than 70% of its population, 80% of its industry, and all of its airfields and seaports are located. Missiles launched from the Judean hills pose an immediate threat to Jerusalem, Israel's capital. Israel's only international airport, Ben Gurion, would be in the range of even primitive rockets, while all planes taking off and landing would be threatened by shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles. More advanced weaponry would be able to hit virtually any point in Israel. If Israel were forced back to the 1949 armistice lines, the Green Line, the country's width would be reduced to a narrow nine-mile waistline that would be impossible to defend. That's why any future arrangement must include Israeli control over key areas of the mountain ridge and a demilitarized Palestinian state. Israel's narrow borders means a combat aircraft can cross the entire country in under four minutes. In less than two minutes, an enemy plane could penetrate the country's airspace via the Jordan Valley and reach Jerusalem. In order to thwart an aerial attack on Jerusalem, a hostile plane must be shot down at least 10 miles east of the capital to prevent it from crashing into major population centers. Therefore, Israel must be able to identify hostile planes before they cross the Jordan River line and intercept them shortly after. To defend itself, Israel must control the airspace over the West Bank. Israel's transportation arteries, and in particular the Trans-Israel Highway, enable travel and connection between Israel's regions. They also assure the mobility of the Israel Defense Forces in case of attack. Protection of these vital arteries is essential in order to ensure that 1. Civilians aren't victims of terrorist gunfire. 2. Regions of the country cannot easily be cut off. 3. The mobility of Israel's defense forces is not hindered in the case of invasion. To defend itself, Israel must control its main arteries of transportation. There is enormous uncertainty about future trends in the Middle East. Iran is determined to become the supreme power as the U.S. withdraws from Iraq. No one can guarantee the future of many of the current regimes in the region. Today, more than ever, it is crucial to ensure defensible borders for Israel. This is one reason why today it is so safe to go to Israel, because they control the borders, they control all of it. And for our government to want them to give up uh, Gaza, I mean, give up, uh, uh, go back to 67 borders, uh, give up the, the, uh, Jerusalem, uh, it would make them indefensible. And uh, again, that's, that's why the region is so unstable now. Because of time, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to give you the, well, let me do this, not that. I'm going to do this, okay? I'm going to give you one verse of what we should be doing in these times, and then I'm going to close with the signs. I'm going to give you the quick signs, all right? So Rev, um, Romans 13, 11 through 14 says this, And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Uh, because we realize we're in the last days, the Bible says it's time now for us to wake out of sleep. Uh, there's a slumber that's over the church, and we need to wake out of that and allow God to use us again to reach, uh, reach the harvest, reach a lost world. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to close with the signs at a glance. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring these signs in. I'm going to list them, and then as the full screen comes, you can take a picture uh, I got 25, so I'm just going to hit them real fast. I won't, I'm not going to elaborate. I'm just going to bring the signs in, all right? All right, wars and rumors of wars, Matthew 24, 6. Uh, nations rise against nations, Matthew 24, 7. False Christ in the last days, Luke 21, 8, Matthew 25, 5. Distress of nations, Luke 21, 5. Famines, uh, Mark 13, 8, Matthew 24, 7. Fearful sights in the heavens, Luke 21, 11. Earthquakes in divers or many places, Matthew 20, 24, 7. The love of many waxing cold, Matthew 24, 12. Pestilence, excuse me, Matthew 24, 12. Disobedient to parents. Uh, I want to say something on that, but I'm going to go on. 2 Timothy 3, 3, 2. You can take a picture of that. These are just indicators. And just you can go back through them in your time. Uh, I'm going to move forward. Okay, let's see. All 
All right, he's going to go to the next one. All right, 11, rise of false prophets, Matthew 24, 11. Uh, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy 4, 1. The gospel being published, Mark uh, 13, 10. Uh, without natural affection, 2 Timothy 3, 3. Ever learning and never coming to uh, the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3, 7. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, 2 Timothy 3, 4. Traitors, uh, heady, high-minded, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 4. And then uh, scoffers and mockers, 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Jude 1, 17 through 19. I'll hold you a few seconds. You can take the picture of that one. And we're almost done. All right. Okay. We have one more camera back there, all right? Now, the last, Israel's rebirth, Ezekiel 36, uh, verses 8 through 11. Jerusalem, a burden, some, uh, burden to the nation of the world, Jer uh, Zechariah uh, 12, 2 and 3. Uh, Israel filling the world with fruit, Isaiah 27, 6. Many shall betray one another, Matthew 24, 10. Mark 13, 12 through 13, and Luke 21, 16. Knowledge will increase, Daniel 12, 4. Uh, iniquity shall abound, Matthew 24, 12. And then the last one, men's hearts failing them for fear, Luke 21, 26. And again, these are just signs. These are indicators that you can look at, you can track. You know, I would tell Christians all the time, you know, put these in your Bible. You know, uh, a good reference point when you're talking to family members. They say, man, what is going on? And they still tell you all this stuff is going on. You know something, the Bible talked about that? And you can show them the scripture and then you can literally, literally bring them in, you know. So I want you to bow your hearts as we close this session, all right? Father God, we love you. And again, I thank you so much for the word of truth. And again, oh Lord, I pray as we allow the word of God uh, to sink deep in our hearts, let it motivate us, dear God, to reach a dying world that don't know you. Lord, let us go after the harvest with a passion. And Lord, we love you and we thank you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
We're going to work out some bugs here, and uh, I want to introduce Don Stewart, who is live from Southern California. And uh, Don is an internationally recognized Christian apologist and speaker. He's a graduate cum laude from Talbot Theological Seminary and in theology from Law of Strasbourg, France, as well as Biola University. Don is also best-selling and award-winning author. He's written, how many books have you written, Don? <laughs> about 100. He's written about 100. So um, can you, is he on? Can you? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Great. And we're just blessed to have Don with uh, this afternoon, uh, all the way from California. He's got something important to share with us. So, Don, bless you. Thank, Thank you, Joe. Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. So, do I go to 20 and after? <laughs> okay, when, when, do I, when do I say amen? amen. amen. Can, you see, can you see the audience? No, I can't. I can see you. Well. Oh, there. Oh, what a good looking group. Hi, audience. Hi, how you doing? Oh, they're still coming in, huh? Okay, no problem. Still coming in. Okay. You probably. I can't hear you. I didn't hear that. And I can't. You'd probably, I can't. You'd probably rather see them than me, right? Oh, it's good to see you too. Okay. Mute button here. I cannot hear your audio. Okay, I'm going to sit, sit down and let you take over. Can't hear you. Okay, I'll unmute it. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. And you're off. Okay. You're off. What time do I what time do I end? 20 after? I can't hear you. <laughs> when you pull the plug, I'm done. I know. I got that. Okay. I'll shoot for how about 20 after. That's that what you had before. Is that all right? That good? I can't I, I can I can't hear you at all, Joe. Okay. All right. Go. All right. I hope everybody can everybody hear me? Uh if not, I hope you brought along an amplified Bible. Um uh it's nice nice to be with you people. I um so I've been to this conference thing once or twice, and some of the most wonderful people I've ever met are uh, you folks there. Uh, now, I'm assuming, no, let's see, am I not on? I got, uh, we working yet? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Go ahead. You can, okay, just so, gotta, we just got to mute the phone here so oh, we don't okay. get echo. Okay, okay. What time do I? 3.20. 3.20. 3.20. or 2.20. Okay, 220, 20 after, okay? 1220, we'll have Joe go back on and let you know when it's uh, All right, sounds good. All right, are we, li are we live and in color now? Are we working? Yes, we yeah. are. Oh, good, good, good. So now everybody can hear me? Everybody sat down and uh, we're ready to go, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, the technology, isn't this? It's, it's great. Anyway, uh, hi, everybody. It's nice to be here with you. You have a fantastic group of speakers. I wish I could uh, have been there. I, uh, I'm so impressed with each one of them. Don Perkins has been a good friend for years. Tommy Ice has been more than wonderful to me as the um, uh, d director of the, the Pre-Trib Center. And then uh, Bill Federoff. I was going to I never met him. I was at a conference when he was speaking. I wanted to see him afterwards, but about 100 people surrounded him, so I never got to, to say hi to him. Anyway, it's um, it's nice to be here. It's been an interesting two years now. 
The reason I'm not here is because in 2020, on about the third day of December, I was losing my strength when I was doing a TV program on uh, his channel, Breaking News. And uh, make a short story long, I not only got sick, I started having hallucinations. And I haven't had a hallucination since 1968 at a Jimi Hendrix concert, the Hollywood Bowl. So I knew something was wrong. And so basically, I caught the... Uh, the virus, the plague, as it were, I was out 50 days and I got over that. But about a year, a year to the day um, on um, December 4th on uh, 2021, I had a quadruple bypass. And so I'm still alive. I'm still here. Glad to be here. I've only spoken twice publicly in the last uh, since November 14th, 2021, when I had the bypass. But I could do something like this now. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, a look at our website, not, not right now, but I mean, look at it, educatingourworld.com, because on it is my material. Everything on it is free. There's no charge for anything that we do. There are 64 books that are there, a PDF file that you can download, a number of videos, five audio books, and the such like, and uh, please take advantage of it. Uh, again, they're, they're, they're for free. There's no obligation there, and we want you to... Um, to, you know, take advantage of all the material on 11 different topics, God, Jesus Christ, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the afterlife, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Bible prophecy. Now, on uh, January 1st of this year was the second time I've spoken in the last 15 months. I did a talk called 12 Biblical uh, Last Days Predictions That Are Happening Right Now. 12 Biblical uh, Last Days Predictions That Are Happening Right Now. Now, if we can't get through all 12, never fear. On our website, educatingourworld.com, we have a video of it, which I did about 50 minutes long, number one. Number two, all the content is there, too, in a PDF file, so you don't have to write fast. If I'm talking too fast, say, slow down. It's all right there, okay? So uh, hopefully, um, now, uh, hopefully not all of you have seen it. And if you have, I'm sorry, but I'm going to go over it again because we've had a really tremendous success with it. Uh, I did a program with Tom Hughes on Hope for Our Times on the same subject, and so far we're, co we're close to 350,000 views of watching uh, this or talking about it. So I think it'll be very, very helpful to you. But again, educatingourworld.com is where we have the video, where we have the PDF file of, of the 12 uh, predictions about the last days that are now being literally fulfilled. We call this the Bible and tomorrow's news. And so here we go. Basically, the God of the Bible is the only God who exists, and he's made many predictions about the future. We have documented them in uh, one of our books called uh, God's Work in History, 50 Biblical Prophecies Made and Fulfilled. And the bottom line is God has a track record. He predicts things, and they always come to pass. They always come true. Now, he's also done some prophecies, pr predictions about the last days. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 12, we're going to read verses 8 through 10, where Daniel the prophet is writing about the last days, and he admitted that he did not. We, everything okay there? Well, there's the audience. Okay. Joe, you had a worried look on your face. Does that mean yeah. we're... Yeah, just, everything's fine. Keep everything's going. fine? Okay. Yep. I, just, just wondering, just, you know. I didn't know if the rapture had happened and you and me were the only two left, so uh, wouldn't be wouldn't be surprised. But anyway, all right, Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. Daniel the prophet, writing about last day's events, admitted that he did not understand what he was writing about. He specifically was told that only those living at the time of the end would understand them. And here's what it says, Daniel 12, 8. I heard, but I did not understand. So I said, sir, what will happen after these things? He said, go, Daniel, for these matters are closed and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made clean and refined, but the wicked will go on being wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. All right. That was a prediction that was made at the time of Daniel to Daniel the prophet in chapter 12. And basically it says this, the when people try and understand, Bible prophecies, particularly last days, they're not going to understand until the time of the end. But then there's a specific promise here at the time of the end, the wise will understand. Who are the wise? People like us that take God's word seriously and uh, believe God meant what he said and said what he meant. 
And so we can understand what's going on. So there are two questions we're going to answer from the Bible during this talk right now. Number one, what should we expect to see happening in the last days according to Holy Scripture? And what in the world do we see right now? And so what we're going to do is look at 12 specific, if I get to all 12, 12 specific biblical predictions about what the world will look like in the last days. And we're going to find out that every single one of them is either coming to pass or the stage is being set for to come to pass. This is uh, literally amazing. Okay, biblical prediction number one. And here's what the Bible assumes about the last days. The entire population of the earth will be able to watch certain prophesied events in real time. Now, in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, there's the account of the two witnesses who come on the scene. Um, they, for three and a half years, preach uh, the gospel to the, the world at this particular time. They, uh, they cause a lot of problems to the people living on the earth. Finally, the uh, Lord allows the final Antichrist to put them to death. And uh, we read in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, when they have completed their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss or the abuso will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. And then we're told their bodies will lie in the city of Jerusalem for three and a half days, in the, in the streets of Jerusalem, and they won't be permitted to bury them, all right? Um, they won't be placed in a tomb. And then we have this, and this is the punchline here. And those who live on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate even sending gifts to each other, because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. All right, so for three and a half days, they're lying in the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, people from all over the earth, don't miss this, uh, from every people, tongue, will see their dead bodies and celebrate their deaths like sending gifts to one another. Now, obviously, there won't be Christmas then, because the Antichrist is ruling, and they won't recognize Jesus, but they'll be having their own Christmas there. So here is our first great expectation, the first question we ask, namely, at the time of the end, it is assumed that everybody on the earth will be able to see an event in real time. Now, can you imagine commentators in the past, one of the things we've done in one of my book, 25 Signs from Near the End, we quote a number of them, commentators living in the past, trying to figure out how that could be. How, I mean, even in the Roman Empire, uh, they couldn't see at three and a half days would be not enough time for people to understand what's going, obviously not to see uh, these events take place. How in the world could everyone on the place of the earth observe such a spectacle uh, limited to one a different geographical area? And so actually there's a couple other passages that we see something similar. Matthew 24, 15, when Jesus said to his disciples, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, then, then leave. Well, the abomination that causes desolation can only take place in the Holy of Holies in the temple, and nobody else is going to see it but the high priest, and, uh, and uh, that's it. And so how in the world could that be seen? And then in Revelation chapter 13, when we have the final Antichrist and the false prophet basically telling the world that uh, they've got to, you've got to worship the beast, that's what the false prophet says, um, the whole world is going to get the message there. So here is the big question. How in the world could this happen? How in the world could the entire world see the deaths of the two witnesses, see them lying in state for uh, three and a half days, and then uh, miraculously come back to life? How could it be? Well, we don't have to wonder any longer, do we? In fact, we've got an example of the whole world being able to see something right now. And this is probably what we're for the breadth and length of it. We go to Elon Musk and Starlink. Starlink is the world's most advanced broad, broadband satellite internet. Let me read you what it says about them from their website. Starlink is the world's first and largest satellite constellation using a low Earth orbit to deliver broadband internet capable of supporting streaming, online gaming, video calls, and more. Leveraging advanced satellites and, and user hardware coupled with our deep experience with both spacecraft and on-orbit operations, Starlink delivers high-speed, low-latency internet to users all over the world. Right now, they have about 3,400 satellites up. They've just had another uh, launch just the other day. And basically, they're in the process. They're very close to covering the whole world. I talked about a year and a half ago to a, a man who's an engineer at Starlink, and he said, yeah, by this, supposedly by last December, they're going to be able to cover the whole planet where anybody anywhere that has the little satellite dish uh, can can basically, if you get your computer, hook up to that or a phone or whatever, and you can get, get the internet. And now it's even gotten better with the 5G networks. There's no limit to how many people in one particular area can log on to the internet. So right now, 
uh, even in the present and soon in the not too distant future, the entire world will be able to watch Revelation chapter 11 unfold. Now, this doesn't happen. We know Revelation uh, 11 to the midpoint or so of the Great Tribulation period. And so uh, we can imagine the technology, how it's going to increase uh, then. But here's the first uh, question. How in the world did Scripture know that something like this would happen? Something like this would take place at the time of the end? Well, it's because God knows the future. And one of the interesting things about this, until this became a reality, really some of the prophecies in Scripture, particularly this one, Matthew 24, 15, and Revelation 13, couldn't be fulfilled because it assumed that everybody on this planet would be able to see in real time these events take place it is now a reality. This is literally mind-boggling, gang, but this is what the scripture has predicted. And again, let me tell you, uh, living in the, growing up and becoming, I've been a believer 53 years now, in the 1970s, when we read passages like this, people just laugh at us. What do you mean? Everybody in the world going to see something? You guys are crazy. That'll never happen. Huh, well, here we are in 2023, and it can happen. So biblical prediction, number one, there'll be technology in the last days. When anybody anywhere can see in real time an event taking place, in the city of Jerusalem. All right, biblical prediction number two is also found in the book of Revelation chapter uh, uh, 13, verses 11 through 16. We won't read it, we'll summarize it. And that is this, all financial transactions worldwide will be able to be monitored. Now, this is the famous passage where the uh, the second beast comes up out of the uh, earth. This is the, uh, the false prophet, the, uh, you know, sort of like the John the Baptist, the final antichrist. And basically, he's performing all these signs and wonders, and he's forcing people, as we read here, to worship the first beast, the final Antichrist. He's empowered to, he, he forces the people on the earth to actually, they make an image of this first beast, and the the uh, fi- the false prophet, they're able to give life to this beast. And then, of course, the for our purposes, what's interesting, they worship the image of the beast. If they don't, they will be killed. And we're told no one can buy or sell unless they bore the mark of the beast on, of course, we know in the right hand or the forehead, the famous 666. Now, let's appreciate what the Bible predicts here. There's a worldwide system put into place where nobody is allowed to buy or sell without the mark of the beast, the number 666, on their right or their forehead. This system is going to be managed by the second beast called the false prophet. He'll force the people of the world to worship the image of the first beast, the final antichrist, and those that don't will be put to death. But here's the problem. How in the world can anyone monitor a worldwide economic system? Can you imagine even 50 years ago, trying to figure out how this could be, maybe even 25 years ago, well, maybe 30, 40 years ago, but how this could happen where there's a a, a system in place where no one could buy or sell without a mark on their right hand or their forehead? Well, we know the answer now, don't we? We talk about the digital technology, as it were, the impossible will eventually happen. It is happening right now. Here's some recent headlines, by the way. Coming central banking, digital system, the end of money as we know it. Central Bankster admits they plan to control the U.S. with central bank digital currency. U.K. prepares to introduce a digital pound uh, central bank currency and digital currency. The Fed moves to monetary totalitarianism. So here's how this can be, you know, uh, fulfilled. And this was impossible until right now, because there's no way you can have someone monitoring every financial transaction. Well, you can if all the transactions are digital, and that is what the Bible assumes something like that will take place. Tim Cook, the present CEO of Apple, said the next generation of kids won't even know what money is, because everything will be done digitally. Uh, many of you have on your phone. I have an Apple phone, by the way. At one of the just bought the 14. Some of you have the Apple, others are on the dark side of the force and have uh, another type of phone, the uh, whatever. Uh, but anyway, the, the idea is you can do these uh, transactions, which is really nice right here. You just stick the thing up and it reads it and it's all done. But see, when you have a digital transaction, what does it mean? It means it's, it's your transactions in some database that can be monitored. So that's the key. All these can be monitored and the world is pushing to this. Uh, basically right now, about 95% of the countries of the world are are working on digital technology where the cash will be done away with and everything will be done digitally. All all transactions will be done that way. So before you know it, uh, you would not have to have any cash. Your account will be debited digitally when you make the transaction. Of course, that means they'll they'll tell us, well, you don't worry about it. You know, no one is going to know about this. We've got great security here. 
Yeah, right. But the bottom line is someone will be able to know every transaction that's being made on planet Earth because there won't be any done without them. So again, we ask the question, how in the world could the writers of Scripture know not only that the whole world could watch transactions taking place in real time, such as what happens in the city of Jerusalem with the uh, uh, false prophet, the Antichrist, and the two witnesses, but also how in the world could every transaction on Earth be monitored? It assumes a world that didn't exist at the time of the Bible. This is the point we're ma making. It assumes a world that didn't exist 50 years ago. But like Daniel said, that passage which we read, Daniel 8 through 10, at the time of the end, the wise will understand. They'll get it. And now it makes perfect sense why this will happen and how it will happen. So again, uh, the second one, uh, mind-boggling that, that something like this could take place. It has taken place. We're right now in that. And so... Uh, Amazing, amazing, amazing. All right, let's go to biblical prediction number three, and that is the nation of Israel will be in the world's spotlight. The nation of Israel will be in the world's spotlight in the last days. Now, actually, this is cumulative of what Scripture predicts. In my book, 25 Signs, we're near the end, and of course, it's a free download on educating our world. Um, we, we move towards that. It's one of our signs there. But first, we talk about the sign of the miracle of Israel's existence, the fact that they will come back, sign number three, to their homeland in the last days, and the fact that they will unite the city of Jerusalem, where there'll be a, a united state of Israel in the last days. In fact, we've got the 75th anniversary coming up, the modern state of Israel existing, and of course, the city of Jerusalem in 1967, June of 67, that anniversary is coming up also. All right, but here's, here's the prediction. The nation will be in the world's spotlight in the last days. They will not only exist they're going to be in the spotlight of the world. How do we know this? In Zechariah chapter 12, the first three verses, we're told at the time of the end, not only two things, the regional nations will be against Israel, but the whole world will be against them. Well, the whole world not going to be against you unless the whole world knows about you, right? In the book of Revelation, we got chapter 16, the campaign of Armageddon. Where do the armies line up? They line up in Megiddo. Um, where is that? In the uh, state of Israel. And so the nation of Israel is going to be in the world spotlight. So not only going to exist in the last days, but also they're going to be in the constantly in the headlines. And again, you can't look at a news organization today, any type of news story, without seeing Israel in the headlines. Now, what's interesting, they have a continual search uh, for peace in Israel because of the hatred that's there for them. But the fact they're always in the headlines, which brings us to the fourth prediction there's going to be a continual persecution of Christians and Jews. As we talked about in the last point, the whole world will be against Israel. Continual persecution against Christians and Jews. Now, here's what's interesting. I want you to take a step back and think about this. How in the world did the biblical writers know that Israel would not only exist in the last days, and but that Christians would also exist in the last days, and these two groups, one is an ethnic group, one is a group that has a certain doctrine of belief, both of these groups would be persecuted in the last days, the two that are singled out in Scripture. But to be persecuted, you have to exist. You have to be preaching the message of Jesus Christ, and that's precisely what they are doing. So again, we ask the question, well, how in the world did the Scripture know this? How, how, there wasn't even a given that there would be a nation of Israel. Uh, they were gone almost 1,900 years from their home. Well, there was always a nation, but to have a modern state of Israel, there, that, that is just seemingly impossible. Number two, Christians. Um, interesting, David Barron, we quote him. Uh, he was a, a Jewish writer in the 19th century who became a believer in Christ. He wrote a number of books, one called The Rays of Messiah's Glory. And David Barron said, B-A-R-O-N, said that uh, in the history of Israel, there have been 40 people who have come that we know of who claim to be the Messiah. Most names have been long forgotten, but uh, if you're a history buff, you can find those names someplace, somewhere. They've all been forgotten because once they died, one of two things took place. Either the they were replaced by, you know, second in command, or the movement just fell apart. But sooner or later, the movement fell apart. There is one exception to that, and that is, of course, Jesus Christ. When he died, not only the movement grew, but it's expanded to the entire world. And that's why Jesus could say, you go into the whole world and preach the gospel. The whole world will hate you. Again, think about this. He's talking about the entire, not just the Roman Empire, the entire planet. And yet, this is exactly what Scripture says. And we hear that Christians and Jews will be persecuted. 
Now, this isn't the news flash, gang, but who are the two people groups that are persecuted the most in the world? And the answer is Christians and Jews. 70% of the persecution in the world is against Bible-believing Christians. It is heartbreaking to see there's not a day goes by where a Christian isn't murdered, um, you know, for his or her faith in Jesus Christ. In our country, unfortunately, we're at the place right now where being a Christian is just uh, something that's, uh, you know, you're, you're, in fact, give you an example. I'm here in California, the land of fruits and nuts, and we have a governor, Gavin Newsom. He calls us Christians uh, regressives. We're not progressives. We're regressives. In other words, uh, we're kind of like Neanderthals. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. I thought I'd never wish for the day where Jerry Brown was still governor of California. But anyway, uh, we still exist. We're being persecuted. But this is just what the Bible says. So if, as we look at these first four predictions, what are we? God is four for four, talking about the last days. Uh, there's a worldwide system in place or uh, everybody can watch events in real time. Anybody anywhere on planet Earth, digital money is coming to the forefront where that's going to be the only uh, coin of the realm soon in the future. Israel is in the spotlight of the world. And not only in the spotlight, Jews and Christians specifically are told will be persecuted. All right, we move to number five. Now, this one to me, well, they're all interesting. The Ezekiel 38-39 last day's coalition of nations that will attack Israel will be forming. Now, this one is particularly interesting because what we have in Ezekiel 38-39 is the, uh, in fact, I got a whole book on the subject, one of the ones in Bible prophecy called the Ezekiel 38-39 invasion. We go in great detail of all this. In our book, uh, 25 Signs, we're near the end, we talk about it too. But bottom line is in the last days, there is a coalition of nations that will get together and attack Israel. But you've got four groups involved here. This is important to understand. Specifically, the Bible says there's Israel, who is the attackee. They're going to be attacked. Second, the coalition of nations, which will join to attack, which include Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Number three, nations who will not invade, but will ask questions about what's going on. And specifically mentioned in you know the geography that's mentioned at that time would be Sheba and Didan, which are the modern-day Gulf states. And number four, the countries that are conspicuous by their absence, such as Egypt. Egypt been involved with every war with Israel. However, a peace treaty was uh, signed in 1979, and they have been in, at peace with Israel since that time. Now, here is the problem, though. When we were doing this talk, and you know, in the early 70s, mid 70s, everybody, all these groups were in the wrong place. In other words, we put up the, the charts, and here's what's going to happen in the last days. Israel's going to be attacked. Okay, fine. But here's the nation's going to attack. It includes Russia. Well, no one had a problem with that. But also Iran and Turkey. Hmm. Iran was Israel's best friend in the Middle East at that particular time when the Shah of Iran was running the show. Turkey is the place where uh, the Israelis took their vacations. They were very much, Turkey's a member of NATO. They were a huge friend of Israel. But they're going to be on the attacking list, joining with Russia, which is interesting because never once in the history of the human race of these two geographical areas, modern-day Iran, modern-day Turkey, ever join in a military coalition. But this was predicted at the time of the end. Then on the other hand, you've got the, the, you know, the ones that won't attack, including the Gulf states, um, the, the, again, which are so much, you know, been that they're going to be protesting what's going on. But then you got Egypt's not going to attack. In fact, Egypt's not even mentioning as being involved. So what it was, again, when we were doing these charts, we go, okay, here's who's going to attack, here's who's going to sit on the sidelines, and, and here's who's going to protest, and here's who's not existent, like Egypt. Well, the problem is everything was wrong, but again, we said just sooner or later, you know, just keep waiting. Before you know it, everything will work out, and everything certainly did. We know in 1979, like I said, the Camp David Accords, uh, Israel made peace with uh, Egypt. Jordan followed in 1994. Um, We've got the good guys who are the, the bad guys once were now the good guys. Egypt now uh, is, you know, uh, at least has a peace treaty with Israel. Iran, which is Israel's best friend, uh, became, of course, the Islamic Public Republic of Iran. Turkey has gone over to the dark side of the force, basically because of the man Erdogan, who wants to bring back the, the great Ottoman Empire in the last days. And so basically what we see is the exact opposite of what we saw in the 19, early 70s, but precisely what the Bible predicted. Let me illustrate. We um, 
couple things. When uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, the late pastor of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, was in Israel in the, in the mid-70s, right after the Yom Kippur War, he's with some of the Israeli Defense Force members there, the IDF. And Chuck says, uh, fellas, he's up at the border between at Israel and Lebanon and Syria. He says, fellas, look, it's not Syria. It's not Lebanon. It's going to be your problem. Your problem in the future is going to be Iran. When he said that, they laughed at him, said, Chuck, Iran's our best friend. They will never be our enemy with us. They're the ones, in fact, if they didn't support us during this last war in 73, we wouldn't exist. They're not, they're not going to turn on us. Chuck says, just mark my words, guys. Well, a few years later, the Shah was deposed. The Islamic Republic of Iran took place, and Iran became a state sponsor of terrorism around the world, amongst other things, saying, death to Israel. Well, at that time, then Chuck started getting all these phone calls from these Israeli generals in Israel say, Chuck, what's going to happen next? And uh, what Chuck would say, look, it's in the book. I'm not a prophet or a son of the prophet. It's, it's in the book that Iran is going to be an enemy at the time of the end. Egypt, which had been your enemy, is going to be neutral. And all these things now have fallen into place perfectly. Again, it wasn't the case in the early 70s. It's only the case now and just in recent years, particularly in 2023. So this last day's coalition um, basically has now um, is formed. I mean, it's it's there. It's there for the taking. Russia, Iran, and Turkey, the leaders of these three countries have met at least four times in the capitals of each of them in the last few years. Again, something unheard of until modern times, but precisely what the Bible said. So here again, we got a prediction about the last days. Prediction number five, that is everything's falling into place just like the Bible said. All right, number six. Now, this one here is really interesting. Uh, well, they're all interesting. What Israel will look like in the last days before the Ezekiel 38, 39 invasion. All right. I about, um, I don't know, it was about 10 years ago, I was asked to do a talk on the Ezekiel 38, 39 invasion to a, a good church. I became very good friends with in Appleton, Wisconsin. And they said, okay, Don, we know you've been talking about this. You were teaching a class on it. We want a one-hour talk on the Ezekiel 38-39 invasion. Well, the problem I had was I had been teaching a course for a year and a half, and I had about 200 pages of notes. And I thought, you know, I know I talk fast. I don't think I can get 200 pages done in an hour. So I said, let's try something else. And so what I thought I'd do, you know, I'm try I always trying to think out of the box. Let's try something different. Let me look, and we start at Ezekiel 36 and go through basically the first part of 38. Let's look and see what the Bible says the world is going to look like at the time of the end. In other words, what I did, I took out the old yellow pad, and I started reading from Ezekiel 36 onward, and there were certain assumptions that were given to us in Holy Scripture about, number one, Israel's going to still exist in the last days, okay? That was an assumption there. Uh, well, they have to exist if they're going to be invaded. There's a personage named Gog, G-O-G, who's going to lead his armies to uh, come to the land of Israel that had been uh, ravaged by war. That's going to, he's going to lead this last days coalition. Uh, the promised land, we're told, had been in ruins for a long time. Um, the people of Israel will be numerous, on and on and on. In other words, what I came up with are 11 different assumptions that the Bible assumes will be true at the time of the end. 11 different assumptions, you know, including uh, the people when they return, they'll form a modern state, they'll have been gone for a long time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So anyway, I write all these down, then I look at it and go, hmm, <laughs> something I notice. Every single one of these 11 assumptions has been literally fulfilled right now. In other words, the stage is set. Again, go down the list. Israel does exist in the last days. Um, the, the land of Israel has been ravaged by war. It's been in ruins for a long time. The people in Israel, however, be numerous. They have been previously scattered, but they return to their ancient homeland, according to Ezekiel 38, 8, when in the last days, they've been away for a long time. They'll be restored and create great wealth. Uh, which cause, will cause the invasion. They'll form a modern state. Their border, and this is a real interesting one, their borders will include the mountains of Israel, um, you know, which, um, interesting, that that wasn't true in 1948 when the modern state was reborn. And they'll come back in unbelief of Jesus as the Messiah. All right, so anyway, those are the predictions made by Holy Scripture. And here we are in 2023, and every single one of them has come to pass. 
Let me ask you something. What do you think the odds are that Ezekiel, writing in Babylon, not even sure that he's ever going to get back to the promised land the first time, they're, they're in exile, will be part writing about a second exile at the time of the end after they come back from that in the last days, then all these things will take place. And here they are right in front of our very eyes, every single one of them taking place. The odds are, you know, again, they're, you can't even calculate them. So if you're following me now, you kind of see in a pattern, aren't you, that God has predicted certain things about what the world's going to look like in the last days, and they're all coming to pass, and they all have come to pass. All right, I see I'm getting, I'm running out of time here. Let me give you at least number seven to get halfway through. They're all, they're all in the book there, and they're all there in the video I did. This one is real, I mean, they're all interesting. This one here is particularly fascinating. Russia's dominant leadership in the Middle East, Ezekiel 38, 1 to 3. It's going to be a Russian leader. Gog is from the land of Magog. He's called the, the Prince of Rosh. Okay, Rosh is a is a geographical area. It's not, uh, and it's what we equate it with modern day Russia, not because it sounds like Russia. Now, it was the furthest nation to the far north of both Babylon, where Ezekiel was, and where um, Israel is. And uh, the leader is going to come from that geographical area. We have an appendix in the book on Ezekiel 38, 39. We're going into great detail why we believe Rosh is uh, the same as modern day Russia. Anyway, they're going to have dominant leadership in the Middle East. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, from 2016 to 2020, when I talked about this with Russia's dominant leadership in the Middle East, I got all sorts of hate mail. What do you mean Russia is going to dominate the Middle East? The Middle East is going to be dominated, which are by the United States of America. Our armies are there. We're protecting Israel. We've scared the daylights out of Iran. And we're we're showing our strength in the world. And so, um, you know, I said, well, I'm sorry. Uh, that's not going to be what's going to take place at the time of the end. Russia is going to be the dominant player in the Middle East. And unfortunately, um, <laughs> which leads us to our, our last one, we'll do number eight. There'll be a continuing decline of the United States. Russia will go up, the United States will come down. And I said, don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger, but this is precisely what the Bible says. And this is precisely what has happened. We've seen now with the new administration, Russia is in control of this whole area of the Middle East. They're, they're, I don't care what anybody says, they're, um, they're in control. The United States is like the proverbial paper tiger. We've gotten out of there. We're disrespected around the world with what's happened. And among other things, in Afghanistan. And the situation was reversed from the last administration of what's happened right now. So we've got a Russia lifted up, the United States coming down. Now, I say this with a broken heart, but this is exactly what Scripture predicted. It's precisely what we've seen, and you and I have seen it in the last couple of years. So I'm going to end with prediction eight here, uh, continuing decline of the United States. And this is the one, gang, that we're all painfully aware of, aren't we? Painfully aware and what we see is our country, um, like Billy Graham once said, if God doesn't judge America, he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, that's that's really true today. We've it's um, when I, I do stories on modern day headlines, I have to say, look, this headline I'm going to give you is not from the Onion or the Babylon Bee. This is actually what's going on in our world today, and I don't need to tell you about that. Uh, William Federer does a great job of going through all these things. What happened with America? It's it's sad, but it's been predicted, and we know it. Jesus said, I've told you these things ahead of time, so when they do take place, you will believe. And so, uh, again, as we've gone through these, we've only done eight out of the 12. The Lord God is eight for eight here. And if you think about it for a second, not even one of them, not even one of them could be predicted by any stretch of the imagination, just humanly speaking, back, you know, 2,000 to 3,500 years ago, predicted in the last days, if this is going to happen, that's going to happen, this is going to happen. Think of all the things that must fall into place to make these a reality, and they've all fallen into perfect place. So the bottom line is this, gang. There's a God in heaven, and here's where I end, and here's the great part of it. The same God who's made promises to the world, what it's going to be like, has made promises to you and promises to me that he's going to be with us, he's going to meet all our needs, he's not going to leave us or forsake us. So what we see from this is not only we can count on the rest of the promises in Scripture with respect to the end of the uh, our present age being fulfilled, but promises with respect to your life and my life that he's going to look after us and be with us. If that doesn't give you confidence, I don't know what will. And if and anybody who watches this or listens to a talk like this and really looks at the evidence, if you're a Christian, you can't get excited about all these things. 
I want to check your pulse because I can't believe uh, if you know you know God and you know what's going on in the world. You, th these things are, are tremendously exciting. And again, there are still a number of other ones, but I think you get the gist and you know where it's all going. God lives. God exists. He's told us the future. And here we see it right in front of our very eyes. OK, Joe, I will hand it back over to you. This is slick. Thank you. We can turn this off now. He's gone. I'll talk to him later. He, no, he's not. Well, he's gone on here. Hey, Don. God bless you, man. God bless you, man. Thank you. Thanks. That was okay. Thank you. God bless you guys. take this one well uh we got through that session technology and all <laughs> already oh, yeah. man, here. <laughs> i'll have to call him on my phone here <laughs> well praise the lord uh as he mentioned educatingourworld.com all his stuff is free on there we have his books back there for sale for $14, $15, but you can get them free online. But if you'd like a hard copy, we, we have, have them. Uh, Don has been here a couple times, and uh, gosh, um, he, he's spoken here at Calvary Chapel a couple times, also not in a prophecy conference. But uh, he's been one of our favorites over the years. We're just blessed to, to snag him in. We would have liked to have him live, but as he mentioned, He's recovering from a heart procedure, and uh, we pray that he continues to strengthen. Listen, let's take a quick stretch back break, and then Tommy Ice is coming with us about the rapture.
Okay. Feature on your schedule, but it's a, a, a greeting from Tom Hughes. We want to share that with you. And then tonight, at 7 o'clock, we're having a little bit of worship with our speaker tonight. And uh, it's going to be a, just a delightful evening. So I know some of you have to get on the road and get back. But those of you who can stick around tonight, it's going to be well worth hearing Bill Federer again. So Tommy Ice, Rapture Part 2. Well, here we go again. Uh, has the rapture already happened? <laughs> okay, oh, here they come. <laughs> it looked like a partial rapture to some extent, which there's no such thing, by the way. Uh, so uh, I have a book, The Case for Zionism, Why Christians Should Support Israel. And uh, that's out there. And uh, about a few months ago, we came out with this book called Understanding the Olivet Discourse, a futurist interpretation of Matthew 24, 25. And uh, I disagree with most Calvary chapels who believe the raptures in Matthew 24 and 25. But, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, I had a professor that said, "If you ever, oh, it's Chuck Misser used to say, if we both agree on everything, there's no need for one of us, you know, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, he had a lot of good sayings. Uh, and so we're back to what is the rapture, because this is a lesser rapture passage. As I said, it's the translation of living believers to heaven without experiencing death in a moment of time. And I distinguish that from the resurrection that occurs in conjunction with the rapture. See, so the rapture, you have to be, be here in uh, your normal current body. Um, even if you've lost weight or gained weight, it's your current body. And so belief in the pre trib rapture exploded in the late 60s in the United States and throughout the 1970s, mainly because of the influence of the Jesus Movement Revival that you've seen that movie that's somewhat about it. Now, the Jesus Movement started in Berkeley, California. Uh, I think it, did I say that last time? I can't remember. Okay, yeah, actually, it started there when two Baptist guys, uh, see, the summer of love was 67 in San Francisco, and many young people had gone there, and they were strung out on drugs in 68, uh, and they were all over the place, and these two Baptist guys started handing out sandwiches on Saturdays, and that began the Jesus Movement. And it started on the campus of Berkeley, California, of all places, of course. And in fact, they used to have the free speech platform in Berkeley, and they shut it down because the Christians started dom denominate, uh, dominating it. You know, we can't have that. And then it's then it spread up and down that coast, and it was all over the country, yeah. you know, the entire United States um, was influenced. But Jesus introduces the rapture the night before he was crucified. I talked about that last session. And the rapture and only uh, other church-age truth is laid out, as I pointed out in John 14, 1 through 3. The Olivet Discourse is in Matthew 24 through 25 and was given a couple of days earlier and did not speak of the rapture or any church age revelation. So the Olivet Discourse spoke primarily of a future tribulation event and said nothing about the church age. And here we see, you know, John 14, 1 through 3, on the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus told the disciples, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, or go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take or receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that place that Jesus spoke of is heaven, uh, the Father's house. He doesn't dwell in the sense that it's talking about. He's, he's omniscient, he's uh, om, omnipresent, he's everywhere, but his uh, 
projected dwelling uh, is in heaven. And so, yeah, take. And so the, uh, the rapture consists of the following progression. The Lord Jesus, along with the spirits of those believers who have died during the church age, descends from heaven to earth's atmosphere. So that's that uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then the bodies of believers who have died during the church age are resurrected, which is the trans transition. I've told some of my preterist friends uh, that on the way up, I'm going to go na 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 na. You know, and all of that. But then I have to admit, well, on the, if I go on the way up, I'm going to have a new body, so I won't have this current sin nature, you know, <laughs> that's going to want to spike the football in front of them, you know, type of thing. Uh, so the bodies of believers who have died during the church age are resurrected. And then believers who are alive at the time of the rapture are changed to receive glorified bodies. And Together, resurrected bodies of dead saints and changed living believers are caught up to the Lord in the atmosphere. See, he, comes, he doesn't come all the way back, right? He's in the air. We go up to meet him, and then we return with him to the Father's house, which is heaven. Now, the Soviet guy, remember Sputnik? He didn't see God in heaven. <coughs> well, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the assembled uh, company of all believers from the entire church age, along with the Lord, accompanying the Lord on his journey from the atmosphere to the Father's house or heaven. So all church age believers are going to be the first to get our resurrection bodies at that point. Even Adam and Eve are with the Lord, but they don't have their resurrection body yet. So that's going to happen at the second coming for others. Now, You've seen me talk about the rapture passages and the second coming passages. We see uh, one of the lesser rapture passages, I believe, is Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Because chapter 1, you, ha you have an outline given in Revelation 1, 19, the things that are, and that refers to chapter 1, where he shows you the glorified Christ, which no one had seen. You had the resurrected Christ after there, but he wasn't glorified. And so Christ now is glorified in heaven, and it is that description of his eyes are flame of fire and his feet bronze and all of that. And that refers to that. But chapters 2 and 3 refer to the current church age, which I lean toward. You know, a lot of people have criticized this view, but I lean toward the idea that the seven churches show the progress of church history secondarily uh, and stuff. But chapter 4, verse 1, then starts the main section of the book of Revelation, which chapters 4 through 19 cover the tribulation period. And in fact, uh, next to Christ's actual ministry on earth in the Gospels and places, uh, that's the second most frequently time period talked about in the whole Bible is the tribulation. There's tons of stuff relating to the tribulation scattered throughout the prophets and all this kind of stuff. Every prophet except Jonah talks about the tribulation period. It's in the book of Deuteronomy. There's a whole framework laid out there in Deuteronomy. It's in the Psalms, you see. And so you have all this prophetic stuff about the tribulation, so it's a tremendous focus of Scripture. So he says in 4.1, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Now John is representative of the church. So the word church is used 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelation. And then John is caught up to heaven and the word church is never used again until right at the end of the book of Revelation, you see. So he representing the church, his view from there on is in heaven. And so he says, And the first voice which I have heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here. And so that's the rapture, I believe. And John, uh, it's talking about John going to heaven, but he reflects the position of the church at this point. And I will show you what must take place after these things. And I kind of forgot about the verse in 119 that says, uh, The things that are 
um, well, second one, seeing that R refer to the church age, and then this very exact phrase, the things which must take place after these things, is in Revelation 1.19. And that's the uh, rest of the book of Revelation there. And we see in 4.2 where it says, Immediately I was in the Spirit. I, I think in the Spirit means he's in revelation mode. In other words, he's receiving revelation from God. And behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. So now he is reporting on what he sees. By the way, uh, 38 times, no, it's, it's more like 48 times in the book of Revelation, he says, and I saw. See, John is observing, he's writing, and I saw this, and I saw that. Like when you get to Revelation uh, 19 and 20, there's like seven or eight, and I saw as he's moving along real fast there. And uh, so he's telling us what he sees. A throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. So this is a ruler that he sees in heaven, uh, who, who's God, who's over the entire world. Um, and verse 4 says, And around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. And these have to be a reference to church age believers because the other descriptions are of angelic beings, like the four uh, beasts there, you know, with different descriptions there sitting around the throne uh, are angelic beings. But here, el the word elder is used. It's never used for angels or anything like that. And uh, they're in white garments, which is we find later in chapter 19 is depicative of the church. In other words, they're our imputed righteousness that Christ gives us. It's pictured as clothing that we put on. Because we're not by nature a godly people, right? But we're clothed, which d displays your status in white robe, garments, and golden crowns. The crowns, as you know, there are five crowns described in the epistles uh, relating to believers. And so here they are pictured here in heaven. <clears throat> and the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever, description of God, and will cast their crowns before the throne. And so this depicts... Uh, that the reason they have those crowns is because of something God did in their lives, you see. So they're showing uh, that these crowns were given to them by God and, and showing that, uh, you know, the crown which shows the right to rule in the ancient world and it's something that they have received from God. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures, uh, and this flips to chapter Five, verse 8, And the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls. Sure, that's not a Fender guitar there, but harps, stringed instruments there, uh, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And so they are interceding uh, as church age believers for the saints, for believers here in heaven. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase us for God with thy blood. Now, as you follow chapters 4 and 5, you know that there's this big drama in heaven of who's going to open the seal. And, and no one is found in heaven, in earth, or in the sea even, who worthy, not so, so qualified to do that. And only the God-man, Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is found worthy to do that. And so he relieves and solves the problem. And as a result, the 24 elders, it doesn't talk about the angels or anything. They're the ones that fall down and worship him because he's solved that great problem that's being dramatized there in the book of Revelation. And he purchased us. So this has to be a reference to church-age believers, you see, uh, with his blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That's four things. This is mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation. And it's, it's 
this phrase is a way of saying everybody. In other words, there's going to be at least one believer from the smallest human breakdown of people, if, you, if I could say it that way. And this is going to be talking about people that become believers during the tribulation. Now, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. And, uh, but the Lord, during the tribulation time, with the 144,000 witnesses in the first half of the tribulation evangelizing the world, that's going to be like 144,000 Apostle Pauls. Paul said, I was one born out of due time, like an early birth type. So it's like people like the Apostle Paul are going to be like the 144,000 that are preaching the gospel all over the world. They're Jewish guys from all the 12 tribes. So Israel's finally going to fulfill their destiny to be a light to the nation, as it says in Isaiah 49. They're finally going to fulfill that. And uh, so there's no grouping of humans is, exactly, is excluded. Every society, culture, uh, populace, and tradition conceivable will be part of God's redeemed community. Not everybody, but people from that. They're we're, we're pictured as being taken out from the earth dwellers that I already didn't I mention earth dwellers last time? Yeah. In fact, the word heaven dwellers is used twice, and it refers to believers in the book of Revelation. So, and thou hast made them, and some readings have us referring to those people we just mentioned, to be a kingdom and priest to our God and they will reign upon the earth. See, Israel was to be a priestly nation to God, right? So he, here he's identifying the believers as believer priests as well. And so uh, this is evidence, what I'm pointing out is evidence that the church is in heaven when the tribulation begins and during that time, and they're the ones that are there. And the only way they would have gotten there in their resurrection bodies with their white robes is the rapture, the rapture of the church, you see. And so these are arguments for pre-tribulation, why the rapture has to occur before that. And then we see, we saw in Revelation 2, 10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Crown of life is one of those five crowns that I referred to, and here it's talking about eternal life. And uh, 311 says, I'm coming quickly, and I, as I pointed out, quickly means suddenly. So it's a qualitative adverb, not a chronological adverb. Hold fast what you have in order that no one will take your crown. And uh, so we see in 511, and I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. So that's uh, millions of angels in this case. See, so, well, I'm sorry, many angels and then the living creatures and the elders. So he distinguishes the elders representing the church here in heaven uh, from the angels. So we see in 512 where it says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. See, what you have going on often in the book of Revelation is you have 13 times uh, Revelation starting in verse 4, chapter 4, cycles between heaven and earth, heaven and earth, heaven and earth, heaven and earth. In other words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what you have is God reveals that he's going to do something in the book of Revelation, and he, he tells you about that in heaven, and then you see the narrative going and showing how that's fulfilled on earth. Then back to heaven for the next phase, and then down. So 13 times it cycles in chapters 4 through 19, uh, actually chapter 20 as well. And so uh, what you're seeing is that God's redeemed and unfallen angels are acknowledging 
that he is worthy in heaven. They're not rebelling like uh, the unbelievers down through history on planet Earth. And so this is a report that shows that he is worthy to do this. He, he earned the right as the second person of the Trinity to uh, redeem mankind. And then as was talked about previously, uh, Revelation 11, 12, and I, that, you know, where the two witnesses are killed, and these two witnesses, so you have the 144,000 Jewish evangelists all over the world, the two witnesses focus on Israel. That's why they're in Jerusalem. And it says God gives them power to call down fire from heaven if anybody messes with them. And I'm sure um, uh, after one or two experiences, people say, don't mess with those dudes, right? They turn into crispy critters or something like that. And uh, then God allows them to be killed, and it has to be the midpoint of the tribulation. Otherwise, it would be happening right when the second coming is happening. So I, I, in my opinion, they have to be in the first half of the tribulation. And, and secondly, the mark of the beast is being given from the midpoint of the tribulation forward. So all of this outreach and evangelism is taking place in the first half of the tribulation before the mark of the beast is beginning to be uh, administered at the midpoint of the tribulation. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Wow, what a day. You know, they were having Christmas all over again because they, these guys were torturing them. You know, somebody preaching the, the gospel is torture to these non-elect people in the tribulation. So they're, they're so excited that they're gone. You know, and uh, as he was talking about, uh, in fact, following up with what uh, previous speaker said, I have a commentary from the late 1800s that speculated that something like a television would be used based on this passage. And that was like 150 years ago before it ever happened. Well, so, uh, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God. See, that's, the, tw the four living creatures represent heaven, the angelic realm, and the 24 elders represent humanity, the church age, just the church age at this point, and worshiped him who sits on the throne saying, amen. So that's a Hebrew word we all know. Amen and hallelujah. Uh, the H in Hebrew is the art definite article. So that's why sometimes it's hallelujah or hallelujah. <laughs> Depends on if you want to be definite or not. But... Uh, so they're agreeing, and this is important, to show that, to, that God has demonstrated to redeemed creation and to the angels that have never fall that what he's doing is righteous and just. See, most people today that criticize God, they don't have a, a biblical standard of righteousness and justice, needless to say. And so they don't see uh, things going on as they really are. And then we flip over to chapter 19, and here's the church who's, make, who's been made ready to return with Christ. And let me just point out, the wedding takes place in heaven, but the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place in the millennium. Does that make sense? Just like we have a wedding ceremony at the church, and then you go to some other place to have the reception, right? Right? And it's, that's the way it is. A lot of people think the wedding feast is taking place in heaven. It's not because you have all the guests. You have passages in the gospel about they'll come, Abraham and Isaac will come from the east and west, and they'll sit down you know, with the Lord at the table and all. That's referring to the wedding uh, supper. So here is the marriage of the Lamb. So that takes place in heaven before the second coming. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. I don't know about you, but women can take a week to get ready for their wedding. 
you know, all that stuff and putting, uh, you know, I have four, I, I had four sisters growing up and no brothers, so, you know, it's hard to get any bathroom time uh, back in the day, but nevertheless, uh, the, the bride is viewed as a spot, as spotless because of the work of Jesus Christ. And the clothing represents your status. You know, like a soldier wears a soldier uniform, a policeman wears a policeman uniform, the milkman used to wear a milkman thing. But, uh, so the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. And it says in verse 8, And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And this is talking about things that we've done as believers uh, through the grace of God. And I don't know how that works, but this is what it says. And uh, so we see another rapture passage. We've talked about this, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2, where we didn't talk about that. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. We briefly talked about that one before. And that's the word uh, episunogoge. Do you recognize a word in there? Synagogue, and it's it's intensified with the preposition at the front epi, and so it, uh, it's a gather. The word synagogue simply means a gathering. So our gathering together to him, that you may not become quickly shaken from your composure or by uh, be disturbed either by a spirit or a message. See, spirits produce messages, uh, or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord is a term, as we pointed out, for the tribulation period. So they're, they're concerned that they were in the tribulation period is their concern here. And um, he goes on and says, Let no one in any way deceive you for it. What, what is it referring to? The day of the Lord uh, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And this word apostasy uh, is a word that uh, the King James translators did not translate. It's what we call a transliteration. They created uh, a Greek word, and it's the Greek word apostasia, and they made an English word out of it. Why did, they did the same thing with baptizo in the Greek, which the word baptism means to dip or immerse. And you can imagine... Uh, during the Reformation, nobody dipped or immersed except the Anabaptists, and they, their life didn't last very long anyway. But uh, So they transliterate the word so they wouldn't have to translate it. You see what I'm saying? And then they fed meaning into it. The same thing here with the word apostasy. Uh, and it means departure. Apo isteme. Isteme means uh, uh, to, to go out, and apo means from. So uh, it simply means departure. And the, <clears throat> some of the earliest, Greek trans, uh, earliest English translations all translated this departure. So if this word was translated departure and not apostasy, then it wouldn't be hard to see this as referring to the rapture. And that's my understanding. Unless the rapture comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So that's the order. The rapture comes and then the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, and the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God, etc. And here is a translation history into English of that word. And you have the Latin Vulgate, which in the Latin is translated departure. And you see the Wycliffe Bible, John Wycliffe in 1384, his original translated departure. Uh, by the way, the King James is 83% the Wycliffe translation. Uh, then you have different, a lot of translations coming out. Tyndall's, 1526, uh, Departure. You have the Geneva Bible, which that's the Bible the Puritans used in America. Did you know they would not allow the King James in the United States? because it was viewed as a Catholic Bible. Why? Because there were Anglicans who were on the translation committee, and they viewed them as Catholics in the United States. 
And they, it wasn't until around 1830 that the King James was being allowed into the United States. Everybody had the Geneva Bible back then. That was the, tra- and by the way, the Geneva Bible had extensive notes, even more extensive than the Schofield Bible had. So Schofield wasn't the first guy to put notes in the Bible. The Geneva Bible, if you, you can go online and uh, read them, look at some of them, or you can buy one, they have reprinted it, and stuff like that. So all the way through, up into 1608, that edition, they had different editions of the Geneva Bible. It first came out in 1559, and you had different uh, revisions of it. And uh, the King James translated that as apostasy. You see what I'm saying? They were the first to do that, and I've already explained why. So the idea, uh, the Reims Bible was the first Catholic Bible in English, 1582, and it translated revolt. See, and that's not even a translation. That's an interpretation. And they believed it referred to the Protestant revolt against the Catholic Church. How do you get that out of that passage? Well, this shows you the bias that there can be in a translation. And so that's what provoked the King James translators to translate it uh, uh, with the word, what's the word there? Apostasy, yes. And they were responded by saying, it's a Catholic church who's apostates, you see? And they, they created that English word at that time. But just saying, uh, I think this is some support for understanding that that word probably refers to the, to the rapture. It's, you know, there are so many different words that are used in the New Testament to refer to the rapture. And so I think this is one of them. And we see in 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 through 7, and do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him. And I've already talked about this passage. It will be taken out of the way. Um, so I'm not going to go through that again. The idea of the Jewish marriage and the scripture, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but when you, if you ever go through that, you see that the marriage of Christ to the church reflects the uh, steps and ceremony of the Jewish wedding. And it's the idea of him going away and the bride's supposed to make, prepare for the wedding and he could come back at any moment. You know, didn't have cell phones, babe, saying, hey, I'm on the way, you know, or anything like that. And she was to be ready all the time, you know, and that pictures the church is to be ready. And Christ uh, had to go back to the Father's house and back then to build on two rooms to the Father's house. And you're talking about, think of, uh, what's, what's that movie? Uh, oh, well, uh, it's an older movie, and you, you have kind of a like in Mexico where they build these haciendas and you have a wall around and people would have rooms on the wall and then in the middle they would eat, you know, in a warmer climate, not here in this part of the country. Uh, and they would cook and have everything in the middle. And so he's, he's gone home to build, and they would usually build a bedroom and a sitting room. So that's the idea of him going back and building on. And so uh, the father had to approve the construction that the son would do before he went and got his wife, his bride, who was betrothed to him. And there's all that imagery supports a preacher of rapture as well. So Revelation 14, 9, 4 through 19, as I pointed out, uh, does not have uh, anything relating directly to the church. So the preacher of rapture is reflected in the fact that the Apostle John is invited to come up to heaven and at the very point in the biblical text between Revelation 3 and 4 where a preacher of to say the rapture will occur. So those are some secondary passages. There's more that we could go through, but uh, Joe wanted me to also talk about the rapture teaching through history. And uh, back in the late 70s when I was a student at Dallas Seminary, Dallas Seminary especially at that time, was started by um, Lewis Berry Chafer and C.I. Schofield. Schofield uh, discipled Chafer, 
and it was the first uh, independent seminary that was not denominationally related. And uh, even though it was almost all the professors were Presbyterian background, most evangelicals up until World War I were Presbyterians. That was the dominant thing. And uh, I'm part of the tradition that started what's called the Bible Church Movement, independent Bible churches. And uh, they, most of them came from Presbyterian churches. And I know in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, there are three or four Presbyterian churches that became Bible churches. They're over 100 years old, you see. And uh, so they became independent so that the denomination could not drag them into liberalism, you know, which is what happened to, eventually to the Presbyterian denomination. And so uh, you have the early church taught eminence that Christ could come at any moment. And that's up to about from about AD 80, even before the book of Revelation was written in AD 95, to about 250. And you have the shepherd of Hermes talks about escaping the tribulation in the second century. You have the apocalypse of Elijah, I'll talk about in a moment, in 285. And you have pseudo Ephraim's sermon in 387. I'll, I'll get into these more in a moment. Brother Dalcino, a, a guy, funny guy, uh, in Italy, taught a preacher of rapture in 1304. Thomas Collier, who was a Puritan, describes the preacher of rapture and then refutes it. But he describes a preacher of rapture, so it had to have existed. John Askell, uh, who was a member of the Irish and British Parliament, was put into prison for the last 30 years of his life because he taught an any moment translation in a book that he wrote in the 1700s. Pretty serious. Morgan Edwards is the founder of, a, of the Baptist College known as Brown University today. And he came from England. He was uh, from um, Wales originally. And he wrote a paper in 1744 at Bristol Baptist College in England teaching a very developed view of the preacher of rapture. And he is the father of American Baptist history in the United States. Everybody relies on his works and other than a book on how to raise money for churches, good Baptist thing, you know, uh, he, his only other book other than church history books was one on the rapture. And we've got it on our website. You can read the whole thing. And he, of course he wrote it in Latin originally because all academic work back then was done. And here's an, uh, I used to, I retired from Calvary University in Kansas City area. And uh, I was editor of a journal, and we have an article there that we identify 35 pre-Darby rapture statements throughout church history. So I'm telling you that in the late 70s at Dallas Seminary, I, no one knew of anybody before Darby. And that's the big argument that people say, well, nobody before Darby ever believed in the preacher of rapture. And Tim LaHaye always said, well, there's got to be somebody. You know, so over the years, our pre-trib study group people have uh, done research, and we're finding them. Guess what? There are over 500 volumes of the Greek fathers in Greek and Latin that have never been translated into English. Uh, those of you that know what I'm talking about, you have those three volumes of the sets of the church fathers. Well, there's another 500 volumes that they didn't include in there uh, in Greek and Latin, and so... Uh, they've never been translated into English in any significant way. People, scholars refer to some of the references in there. Well, we got people now who are going through these things, and they're finding them by the carload. Uh, okay, i got to switch over to this other one here. And the, the post-apostolic church expressions of... and. At post at the apostolic era is up to around 313 when Constantine Christianized the Roman Empire. And the Council of Nicaea took place in 325, and his wife, uh, who was a true Christian, 
uh, Helena, Helena, uh, went to Jerusalem in 325 and spent seven or eight years there identifying the holy places. Now, why did she do that? Because for 200 years, they had piled dung and refuse, human refuse on the Temple Mount so that they would never try to build a temple again. Because the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. 1.1 million Jews were killed. Uh, a half a million were sold into slavery. It lowered the price of a slave for 40 years in half. And then you had the Berkopta revolt, where the Jews took over Jerusalem again in 132 under a guy named Berkopta. He is the first person to claim to be the Messiah other than Jesus. And as was mentioned earlier, something like 40 guys have done that throughout church history. And, but the first one to do it was Jesus, who was the Messiah, and then Bar Copton, 132. And they took over Jerusalem for three, three and a half years, and Hadrian, who was the emperor of Rome, uh, was so upset with them, he said, we have to have seven times more soldiers in Israel than any other place in the empire because they're so, such a rebellious people. And so he sent the military in and they, they destroyed uh, Jerusalem and he renamed it, um, he renamed Israel Palestine. That's why I never use the word Palestine to refer to Israel. It didn't start until 135. And when we did the Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bible, I made sure all of our maps had Israel and not Palestine on there. A little, you can tell I'm a little upset over that. But, uh, but he's the word that, he's the guy that uh, designated as Palestinia. And the Palestinians today try to claim that they're an ancient people going back to that. I'm sorry, uh, the Pal those of you that are older remember it used to be called the Arab-Israeli conflict. And they wanted to, uh, some of the ha uh, Russian handlers of the, uh, of, you know, Russia was behind uh, the rebellion of the Arab people in Israel. And Arafat's handlers said, you've got to create, why don't we call you all the Palestinians so you'll be a minority and it won't be the 23 Arab nations or Islamic nations against Israel. It'll be the, the evil Israel against the poor ancient Palestinians that were found in 1967, you know, and stuff. So uh, I don't know why I got off on that. But nevertheless, ex expressions of eminency abound in the Apostolic Fathers. Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, the Didache, uh, the Epistles of Barnabas, and the shepherd of Hermas are all speak of imminency that Christ could come at any moment, which has to be a reference to a preacher of rapture. Furthermore, Hermas speaks to the preacher of rapture concept of escaping the tribulation. This is what he says. You have escaped from great tribulation on account of your faith, and because you did not doubt in the presence of such a beast. So he's seeing this vision of a beast coming. And he says, go therefore and tell the elect of the Lord his mighty deeds, and say to them that this beast is a type of the great tribulation that is coming. If then you prepare yourselves and repent with all your heart and turn to the Lord, it will be possible for you to escape it. If your heart be pure and spotless, and you spend the rest of your days of your life in serving the Lord blamelessly. By the way, it wasn't until the 1500s that the doctrine of justification by faith was understood in the church. They used to have, in fact, Anselm, around the year 1000, is the first to teach in church history. We're not saying the Bible didn't teach it. We're saying the church's understanding of it around the year 1000 of substitutionary atonement because of some Latin translations and things like that. They didn't understand it very well. And uh, back then, like one guy every 100 years learned a little Hebrew in the Middle Ages, you see. Uh, and uh, only one in two and a half thousand people could read in the middle of it. Most of the priests couldn't even read in the Catholic Church and everything. So you want to keep people under the thumb? That's why they have all the picture windows and all this kind of stuff in Catholic churches. So uh, he's talking about the, uh, this kind of works salvation here, 
which is common in the early church fathers and things, but he's talking about the possibility of escaping the tribulation. Here's the apocalypse of Elijah. And by the way, these were found by a guy who's a preterist post-millennialist, but he's honest enough to bring them to light. And he believes that their preacher of rapture was taught throughout church history, even though he's his polar opposite. He's a post-millennialist, not a premillennialist, and he's a preterist. They believe everything happened in AD 70, you see? But this guy has articles uh, talking about this, Apocalypse of Elijah. The fifth chapter of the Apocalypse of Elijah contains a rapture passage. It says that when the end-time persecution of the Antichrist intensifies, Christ will take pity on his people by sending angels from heaven to snatch up those having the seal of God on their hands and forehead. The an Notice seal is not mark. There's a different Greek word for the mark of the beast that's visible. The seal is an invisible Thing that God apparently during the tribulation puts on the elect. So the angels bear up those last day saints on their wings, remove them from the wrath, see, and lead them to paradise. That's a rapture. Uh, there the raptured saints, he uses the word, uh, receive white robes, eat from the tree of life, and dwell in safety from the Antichrist. So, and uh, recently... Uh, a, a guy named Lee Brainerd who comes to our pre-trip stuff, he lives in North Dakota, and uh, he's never been to seminary. I don't even think he went to college, but he knows he can read Greek and Latin very well. And that's the kind of guy you need to read through these unpublished uh, documents that we say have not been examined. And here he is, and he says, was it possible that there were more pre-tribulational rapture passages waiting to be found in the works of Ephraim, the Syrian. After all, more than 150 of his works are known only in Greek, and the vast majority of these have never been translated into English. So if they wrote in Greek, those are the earliest. They switched to Latin around 400, you see, most of the writings. So Ephraim, the Syrian, who lived from 306 A.D. to 373, was the Nisb Bis was from Nisbis. Everybody knows where that is, right? Just south of Chicago. I'm just kidding. Uh, in modern day Turkey. And Ephraim was a prolific early church writer. And uh, he's considered the greatest saint in the Greek Orthodox Church, early church father at least. Uh, and here, 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 we're going to go through some of his rapture statements. He says, for the elect shall be gathered prior to the tribulation. The, what's that referring to? <laughs> so they shall not see the confusion and the great tribulation coming upon the unrighteous world. So that's a preacher of rapture statement. And then he says, when we, in another document, he says, when we see the saints in glory flying off in light in the clouds of the air to meet Christ, the King of glory, but see ourselves in the great tribulation, who shall be able to bear that shame and terrible reproach? In other words, the left behind. Hey, that'd be a good novel series. But <laughs> yeah, they used to make uh, underwear boxer shorts that had left behind printed right here. <laughs> but That's a play on words. <laughs> so indeed, the grace of God strengthens and rejoices the hearts of the righteous, and they shall be seized up in the clouds to meet him. While those who are lazy and timid, he's describing the characteristics of an unbeliever here, like me, shall remain on the earth trembling. So apparently he thought uh, he was going to be left behind, but he's describing the rapture once again. So he says in another place, watch always, praying continually, that you may be worthy to escape the tribulation and stand before God. For if anyone has tears and compunction, let him pray the Lord that he might be delivered from the tribulation, which is about to come upon the earth, that it might not see it at all, nor the beast himself, nor even hear of its terrors. 
For there shall be famines, earthquakes, and diverse, diverse pestilences upon the earth. So he's talking once again about the possibility of escaping the tribulation. And then we see another place. He says, Therefore, beloved, faithful servants and elect soldier monks, <laughs> uh, let us take up our hearts the full armor which we have been talking about, and without delay meditate on them one by one, that we may be able to fight the good fight and tread down all the power of the enemy, that we might be delivered from the wrath coming upon the sons of disobedience. He continues in another place. Blessed is he who unceasingly remembers the fear of Gehenna and hastens to sincerely repent with tears and groans in the Lord, for he shall be delivered from the great tribulation. Again, count us worthy, Lord, of the rapture of the righteous. There's the word rapture again. When they meet you, the master, in the clouds, that we might not be tried by the bitter and exertable uh, judgment. Still again, let us pray the Lord in great humility that he would take us out, uh, and it has in parentheses in that text, remove us from the coming fear and count us worthy of that rapture, and that is, is also snatching away, when the righteous are raptured or snatched in the clouds to the air to meet the King of glory. Here's a short one. Blessed are those who cry day and night that they should be delivered from the coming wrath. Continuing, blessed are those who cry day and night because they shall be delivered from the coming wrath. Those are in two different locations in his writing. And so that's a dozen or so references to the rapture. And most historians will be shocked to find this out about him, that he taught a rapture. And uh, here's Irenaeus, and he was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Apostle. So Irenaeus is the guy that gives us the date of the book of Revelation, written in AD 95, which preterists want to say it was written in AD 65. There's no one historically holds that view except later preterist people. And uh, so he... Uh, was considered the, the most orthodox uh, of the anti-Nicene fathers, in other words, before 325. And uh, I'm going to go through the, get through this. And here he says, As all perished, then except those gathered with Noah in the ark, so also at his coming. The ungodly in the season of apostasy shall perish, while according to the pattern of Noah, all righteous and godly are to be separated from the ungodly and are gathered into heaven, the heavenly ark of God. For in this way comes the time when not even one righteous man will be found any more among mankind. And when all the ungodly have been made atheist by the Antichrist and the whole world is overcome by apostasy, the wrath of God shall come upon the ungodly. Now, this is, a, this is something that's not in the normal um, canon of Irenaeus's writings. Uh, Eusebius, now this is, an, this is the most amazing thing. Eusebius who was the first church historian, first guy to write a church history, and he was an amillennialist. He hated the millennium, lit on earth, uh, and but he taught a preacher rapture statement. It, I mean, it's pretty amazing in today's uh, thing. But that's because as history's gone on, these things have been clarified and talked about. And you don't come. You know, a millennialist today cannot be a pre-tribulationalist. I mean, because you're not. They don't even believe there's going to be a literal tribulation, let alone a rapture. You see what I'm saying? So, and he says. Uh, for the world shall meet with a great test in the season of apostasy, in which the faithful man will scarcely be found. Suddenly there shall be not even one, because some have been taken and the others left, delivered to the eagles. See, this is the idea. That the picture of using the eagles is they're up in a safe place, up in the thing, that, you know, their nests are way up high. 
In this way, there shall be a lapse of faith among mankind. Therefore, he shall take revenge for his saints, which have been killed by the ungodly. So he's teaching some rapture. Here's another passage. As all perish, then except those gathered with Noah in the ark, so also at his coming the ungodly in the season of apostasy shall perish, while according to the pattern of Noah, all the righteous and godly are to be separated from the ungodly and gathered into the heavenly ark of God, the wrath of God shall be upon the ungodly. And he goes on, suddenly there shall not even be one, because some have been taken and others left behind, uh, delivered to the eagles, you see, up high safely. Um, the apostle Paul was moved to write in this manner on the second coming of Christ, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and with the command, with the call of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and so forth, uh, but the same apostle also sets forth in order of the prophetic writings the end times coming of the Antichrist and his depravity after his glorious appearing of our Savior. See, these are not these parts of Eusebius's work are not in the English, and, and this is what our friend is doing. He's he's translating all these things, and so you see this theme, and of all people. Um, there. Now, I wrote an article in what's called Bibliotheus Sacred Dial Seminary's journal called The Rapture, an Early Medieval Citation, talking about uh, Brother Dalcino and uh, why there, and this is his rapture statement in 387. Why therefore, no, that's not Brother Dalcino. Who was that? <laughs> uh, I can't remember. Uh, Pseudo Ephraim. Uh, why, therefore, do we not reject every care of earthly actions and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Christ, so that he may draw us from the confusion which overwhelms all the world? For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion of the tribulation that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. We have this both in the original Latin and translated. You can choose which one you want to read. And uh, it has 12 paragraphs. This is in the second paragraph. And then he talks about the tribulation in the next few paragraphs. And then in paragraph 10, he talks about the second coming, you see? So this fits very well in this. Well, I've run out of time, so uh, I could go on with even more. But I'm saying uh, the Pre-Trib Research Center and the people that are involved in that, we have a yearly conference, we just had it last December, uh, we do things like this there to find uh, things like this that other people aren't interested in finding. So with that, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have this blessed hope and that now we're learning that believers down through church history have also had that wonderful hope that we have. And uh, we know that uh, among evangelicals today, our blessed hope is in decline in belief but we know from Scripture that you're going to come and take us before the seven-year tribulation. And that gives us hope, and that gives us courage to speak the Word of God, both to our fellow believers and to non-believers, until you come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you again, Tommy. If you just... Being seated for a second, I got a special feature here. Uh, my buddy Jack Hibbs was supposed to send a greeting, and his secretary has been in communication with me, Robin. And uh, Jack has been in uh, Hawaii the past uh, several days. Yeah. <laughs> I think he had a couple of speaking engagements, but then he was on vacation, you know, with his his wife. So I will probably get his his. Uh, encouragement, his greeting to the conference about the middle of next week. So anyway, Jack, God bless you, buddy. I'll, I'll see you on down the road. J Jack has been here uh, speaking uh, live and in person, and, and he's, been, uh, he's given us numerous greetings. But we do have a nice greeting from uh, Tom Hughes. Some of you know him. Incidentally, Tom has a great program on his channel, um, dot com, his channel dot com every Thursday evening. It's a great Great channel, but on Thursday evenings at 9 o'clock our time, 6 o'clock their time, he has guys like uh, Don Perkins and uh, great interviews with uh, other, other speakers. 
9 o'clock on uh, Thursday evenings. Keep that in mind. So, Tom Hughes. Hey, everyone at the Midwest Bible Prophecy Conference. How exciting this is. Uh, everybody there at Calvary Chapel with Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to just say hi to everybody and welcoming them. I'm looking at the guest list there. It's like some of my best friends are there. Don Perkins, Don Stewart, Bill Fetter, uh, Tommy Ice, and I, I, man, this is, you guys are so blessed. How exciting is it? And, I, and my hope is you're also gonna be super encouraged, which I know you will. I'm looking at the guest speaking list. You guys are gonna be blessed. Remember, with all of the wild things that are going on in the world, have joy. For the words of Jesus, Luke chapter 21, when you see these things begin to take place, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That term, Lift up your head, it's with expectant joy, man. We don't have to be down or afraid or anything. Jesus is coming. God bless you guys. Have a great time. And for all of my friends that are speaking, I'll see you all soon. <laughs> I call Tom uh, Mr. Prophecy on Steroids. I mean, he's just, he's just full of information. He's got a couple programs on Facebook and, and YouTube. You can, you can tune in. So listen, we're going to let you go here for, uh, for dinner. Some of you, I know, have to, have to leave and get on the road, but it's been a delight to, to host you today. We pray for traveling graces upon you. But we're going to be back here at 7 o'clock with Bill Fetter and a, a little two or three worship songs before he... he so uh, if you can uh, join us tonight, do so. So God bless you. <laughs> Do you have? Yeah. 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 Yeah.